I've wondered many times, how is it that these things can be little specks in the night sky, but the ancients knew so much about them? Their myths sound wild on the very surface of it, and if you listen to one myth, none of it makes sense. But people that can make art like that cave in France or build something as perfectly orientated to the north, like the Great Pyramid, why would their stories be filled with nonsense? Everything about their myth makes sense when you put them all together, which inspired Emmanuel Velikovsky and later David Talbot to do. And he has this fascinating theory called Saturn theory, and we explore it. For me, the more I learn, the more I keep coming back. And that's what we're getting into right now. We're exploring Saturn theory for our origin. A lot of it makes a lot of sense. And the thing that I like about it the most, it's as interesting as any subject, to put it mildly. So that's where we're headed. This time we're doing the Ev Cochran's version. We pick, we pick, we pick, we pick up something new every time. Saturn Theory by E.V. Cochran. The Saturn Theory, in addition to presenting a comprehensive model of ancient myth, offers a radically different approach to understanding the recent history of the solar system. Briefly, the theory posits that the neighboring planets only recently settled into their current orbits. The Earth, formerly being involved in a unique planetary configuration of sorts, together with Saturn, Venus, and Mars. As the terrestrial sky watcher looked upwards, he saw a spectacular and awe-inspiring apparition dominating the celestial landscape. At the heart of heaven, the massive gas giant Saturn appeared fixed atop the north polar axis. With Venus and Mars set within its center like two concentric orbs, see figure one. Where Venus is the green orb and Mars the innermost red orb. Kind of looks like one of those olives. I wonder if that's why they made it look like that. The olive, that is. It looks just like one, doesn't it? The theory holds that the origin of ancient myth and religion, indeed, the origin of the primary institutions of civilization itself, is inextricably linked to the numinous appearance and evolutionary history of this unique congregation of planets. How does one go about documenting this extraordinary claim? Extraordinary claims, it is commonly said, require extraordinary evidential support in order to be believed. While I believe the Saturn theory can and eventually will meet this crucial test, it goes without saying that a discussion of the various lines of evidence pointing to the polar configuration would require several volumes in order to make a compelling case. In this brief overview, alas, I can do no more than offer a small sampling of the relevant evidence. If the truth be known, the Saturn theory suffers from an embarrassment of riches with respect to evidence which supports the central tenets of the theory, early descriptions of the sun, and various planets from Mesopotamia and elsewhere describe them as occupying impossible positions and moving in a manner which defies astronomical reality, as currently understood, that is. The ancient sun god, for example, is said to rise and set upon the same sacred mountain. The planet Venus is described as standing at the heart of heaven or within the crescent of sin with respect to evidence which supports the central tenets of the theory. Mars is pointed to as a principal agent behind eclipses of the ancient sun god. While not one of these scenarios is possible given the current order of the solar system, each is perfectly consistent with the history of respective planets in the polar configuration as reconstructed by Saturnus. The testimony from ancient myth and folklore is equally unequivocal that the respective planets once moved on radically different orbits and rained catastrophe from the skies. Even if the message has been overlooked and ostracized by everyone except Velikovsky, thus numerous cultures tell of a time when different suns ruled the heavens. This belief was especially common in the New World. The idea that the sun was not eternal 
was shared by other American Indian tribes so widely that we consider it must have been part of their belief long before any culture had arisen in the Americas. The Papal Vu, lauded as the Mayan Bible, attests to the same idea. Their previous son is described as follows. Like a man was the sun when it showed itself. It showed itself when it was born and remained fixed in the sky like a mirror. Certainly it was not the same sun which we see. It is said in their old tales. Equally widespread are traditions which report that a great monster once eclipsed the sun and brought the world to the brink of destruction. Countless cultures preserve memory of the terrifying time when Venus assumed a comet-like form. Spectacular conjunction of planets dominated the celestial landscape. Such traditions can be documented from one culture to another, and upon systematic analysis, reveal numerous analogous structural details. A telltale sign that they were inspired by common experience of spectacular celestial events, rather than creative imagination and fantasy. In addition to the remarkably detailed and consistent testimony from ancient myth and folklore, the artistic record likewise provides compelling evidence that the planets only recently moved on radically different orbits. Consider, for example, three images depicted in figure two here. As I have documented, such images are ubiquitous in the prehistoric rock art of every inhabited continent. Hitherto, they have been interpreted as drawings of the sun by virtually all leading authorities on ancient art and religion. This despite the fact that they do not have any obvious resemblance to the current solar orb. It is noteworthy that the ancient sun god was depicted in the very same manner by the earliest civilizations in Egypt and Mesopotamia. Shows an Akkadian seal in which the shamash, shamash disk, is represented as an eye-like object, as in the first image in figure two. Figure 4 shows the Shamash disk as an eight-pointed star or wheel. Figure 5 shows the Shamash disk as an eight-petaled flower. Numerous other variations upon these common themes could be provided, all impossible to reconcile with the appearance of the solar orb. That's figure 4 and 5. It is at this point that the researcher is presented with a theoretical dilemma. The successful resolution of which promises to unlock the secret of our planet's extraordinary recent prehistory. If one elects to dismiss the specific and consistent imagery associated with these ancient solar images as a product of creative imagination, the typical approach of conventional art historians, one is also forced to dismiss the equally widespread testimony that different suns prevailed in ancient times. This approach has little to recommend it. For it involves nothing less than turning a deaf ear to the testimony of our ancestors, and in any case, which thus far has produced precious few insights into the origin of ancient symbolism and myth. Yet, the alternative is equally unthinkable, for it involves accepting these endlessly reoccurring images as accurate drawings of the ancient sun albeit one different in nature and appearance than the currently prevailing. As bizarre as this possibility appears, at first glance, it does have much to recommend it. The ancient Babylonians were careful to distinguish Shamash from the current sun. It was this little known datum which led Velikovsky to consider the possibility that Saturn formerly appeared more prominent, perhaps even serving as a sun-like body for the satellite Earth. Velikovsky's seminal insight, in turn, served as a theoretical foundation for the subsequent researches of Talbot, Cardona, Rose, Trussman, Newgrosh, and others, who offered further evidence for the basic claim that Saturn once dominated the heavens, a fact reflected in the otherwise puzzling prominence accorded this planet and the earliest pantheons. The Saturn theory receives additional support from the representation of the planet Venus in ancient art. A straightforward interpretation of the various images superimposed upon the solar disk in figure two would understand the first as an eye, the second as an eight-spoked wheel or star, and the third as an eight-petaled flower. 
Now it is a remarkable fact that the planet Venus is consistently associated with these very forms, from one ancient culture to another. The ancient Sumerians, for example, represented Venus as Inanna, as an eye goddess, eight-pointed star, and eight-petaled flower or rosette. Consider the figurine represented in figure six here, thousands of which were discovered by Max Mallowan during his excavations of the Inanna precinct at Uruk. Similar eye goddesses have been found throughout the ancient world, from Neolithic Europe to India. Figure 7 shows an early cylinder seal from the Jemdet, Nasser period, circa 3000 BC, depicting Inanna as an eye goddess, alongside her familiar eight-petaled rosette there. Figure 7, the sacred iconography surrounding the Akkadian Ishtar, reveals the same basic images. Thus, figure 8 shows Ishtar, Venus, together with an eight-spoked wheel, while figure 9 shows Ishtar Venus together with an eight-pointed star. Figure 10 shows Ishtar in conjunction with a rosette-like star. The fact that the planet Venus is associated with the very same forms in Mesoamerica, where the observation and worship of our sister planet formed an obsession, strongly supports the conclusion that such images have their own origin in ancient appearance of the planet. The same conclusion is supported by the fact that cultures as distant and disparate as those of the Australian Aborigines, Maya, Polynesians, and Chinese describe Venus by epithets signifying great eye, great star, and luminous flower. How are we to explain this curious state of affairs whereby Venus is associated with the various symbols seemingly depicted in prehistoric sun images? Surely not by reference to the current solar system, for Venus does not even vaguely resemble an eye, eight-pointed star, or flower. Yet if Venus only recently appeared superimposed against the backdrop of Saturn, Shamash, as per the reconstruction offered by Talbot and myself, depicted in figure one, its role as an eye is explained at once. Upon further evolution of the polar configuration, Venus assumed a radiant appearance, sending forth streamers across the face of the ancient sun god. See figure 11. This situation is reflected in the latter two images in figure 3, and accounts for, for Venus' role as a star or luminous flower. At the turn of the century, it was widely held that the most sacred traditions of the creation, deluge, golden age, dragon combat, etc., were nature myths describing the stereotypical behavior of the two primary celestial bodies. Typically, in allegorical or humoristic fashion, the Saturn theory offers a similar conclusion with the all-important proviso that the planets formerly dominated the celestial and intellectual horizons rather than the current sun and moon, that the earliest gods and mythical figures of the various cultures are celestial in nature is easily shown. The Sumerian goddess Anana explicitly identified with the planet Venus already at the dawn of the historical period, circa 3300 BCE, is a case in point and might well serve as an exemplar for comparative analysis, virtually every ancient culture will feature a goddess with notable structural affinities to Inanna, although the identification with Venus is not always preserved. The Pawnee Indians of the American Central Plains, for example, celebrate the wondrous deeds of the primeval goddess Kiputika, Kiputika identified with Venus. It was her union with the warrior god 
Peraraku. Peraraku. Explicitly identified with the planet Mars, which signaled the crowning event of creation. The second god, Chirawahat, placed in the heavens was evening star, known to the white people as Venus. She was a beautiful woman by speaking and waving her hands. She could perform wonders through this star and morning star, Mars. All things were created. She is the mother of the Skiri. Skiri. As the Pawnee traditions attest, the planet Mars played a prominent role in ancient myth and religion. Wherever one looks, one will find the red planet accorded a numinous power wildly out of proportion to its present modest appearance. The Sumerian war god Nurgle, early on identified with the planet Mars, forms a pivotal figure in comparative analysis. Thus, it can be shown that war gods and warrior heroes from every corner of the globe share numerous characteristics in common with the Sumerian god, including some of a remarkable specific nature to take but one mythical theme of hundreds available. The Makiritari Indians of the Amazonian rainforest tell of a time when the hero, Ahizahama, identified with the red planet, climbed a giant stairway to the sky. The fact that a very similar story was related of Nurgle in ancient Mesopotamia suggests that the mythical theme originated in objective historical events involving the red planet. Yet, one looks in vain for a satisfactory explanation of this particular mythical theme, given the current order of the solar system, wherein a celestial stairway is not to be found. Neolithic rock art, however, offers countless examples of stairway-like appendages descending from the ancient sun god, thereby complementing and helping to illuminate the universal myth of a luminous stairway spanning the heavens. See figure 12. The possibility thus presents itself that the stairway to heaven was a visible apparition associated with the ancient sun god during a particular phase of the polar configuration towards a science of mythology. With the goal of developing a rigorous scientific methodology for the study of ancient myth, the Saturnists would offer a series of basic ground rules deemed to be essential if researchers are to discover the true significance and message of ancient mythical traditions. First and foremost, perhaps, is the general proposition that ancient myth constitutes an invaluable and generally trustworthy source for reconstructing a valid history of our solar system. Far from being a leap of faith, this fundamental finding of the Saturn theory derives from several decades of extensive research into ancient myth and can be demonstrated using normal methods of logic and evidence. A second basic tenet would emphasize the comparative method simply stated no ancient myth or primary cultural institution is fully understandable in isolation egyptian myth to take but one example is incomprehensible apart from detailed analysis of analogous themes and motifs from ancient mesopotamia to the new world both of which provide the indispensable link to early astronomical traditions all but lost in egypt itself Horace's identification with the morning star and Mars offers a notable ex exception in this regard and forms a close analog to the Pawnee traditions surrounding the red planet. Hathor's identification with the Eye of Ra, for example, can only be understood by reference to the widespread idea whereby Venus once formed the central eye of the ancient sun god. Note further that Hathor's name, which signifies House of Horus, captures perfectly the essence of the relationship between Venus and Mars. As illustrated in Figure 1, the planet goddess Hathor Venus, as the Eye of Ra, literally housed the warrior Horus Mars. It is little wonder then, given the reconstruction offered here, that the Egyptian pyramid and coffin texts implore the dead king, as Horus, to ascend the numinous celestial ladder in order to join Ra and reign in the mansion of Hathor in the sky. I am Horus, give me the ladder which you gave to my father so that I may ascend on it to the sky and escort Ra. The third basic tenet of the Saturn theory holds that ancient myth and ritual typically commemorate dramatic events witnessed by human beings. 
If myth constitutes a creative interpretation of the traumatic celestial events in pseudo-historical terms, the flooding of the world, the warrior heroes consorting with a beautiful goddess ritual originated as a purposeful and remarkably fateful attempt to reenact the fateful events in question. Mars, climbing out of the celestial stairway, for example, was reenacted in countless sacred rites throughout the ancient world. The archetypal rite of the sacred marriage attested already at the dawn of history in Mesopotamia purports to commemorate the king's union with the planet Venus, Anana. The original inspiration for this bizarre rite, as I have theorized, was the spectacular conjunction of Venus and Mars in prehistoric times. A fourth basic tenet of the Saturn theory holds that historical evidence together with consistent or widespread human testimony must be given credence. Even if a ready explanation of such testimony is not immediately obvious or appears to contradict current scientific opinion, Velikovsky's admonition in the preface to Worlds in Collision serves as a rallying cry here. If occasionally historical evidence does not square with the formulated laws, it should be remembered that a law is but a deduction from experience in an experiment. Therefore, laws must conform with historical facts, not facts with laws. The famous controversy over the likelihood that rocks, meteors, could fall from the sky, a possibility denied by several of the best minds of the 18th and 19th centuries, might well serve as a prototype here formerly dismissed as too ridiculous to merit serious discussion. The fact that meteorites occasionally fall to earth from heaven was well known to the ancient Sumerians. All but lost for several millennia, such knowledge is once again commonplace amongst schoolboys everywhere. Equally lesson laden is the ongoing controversy over the possibility that rocks from Mars could somehow find their way to earth. Fervently denied by various leading authorities until until quite recently, circa 1987. The eventual triumph of the Martian meteorite hypothesis is yet another classic example of the leading paradigms of the scientific age being instantly overturned by a series of anomalous findings. Such examples could be multiplied ad infinitum. Science, much like religion, proves to be notorious malleable in this regard. What is considered impossible or futuristic by one generation might well come to be accepted by future generations unencumbered by similar prejudices. A fifth basic tenet of the Saturn theory holds that reoccurring anomalies in ancient myth and tradition offer a key to discover. Certainly, it is most unlikely that one culture would invent traditions of fire-breathing dragons or witches that once threatened to eclipse the ancient sun god. Yet, when one finds the very same improbable motif from one ancient culture to another, logic suggests that something other than fantasy and coincidence is at work here, unencumbered by similar prejudices. A sixth central tenet of the Saturn theory holds that the history and evolution of the polar configuration constitutes nothing less than the history of the gods. The birth of the warrior hero, the warlike rampage of the mother goddess, the death or eclipse of the primeval sun god, and a thousand different themes alike all have their inspiration in the spectacular events associated with the evolution of the polar configuration. A seventh basic tenet of the Saturn theory holds that future discoveries vis-a-vis -vis the geology and geomorphology of the respective planets will act to either confirm or deny the model. For it stands to reason that, if the extraordinary history described here has any basis in reality, such events must have left an indelible mark on the planets that participated in the polar configuration. It is also expected that some of these telltale signs of participation in the polar configuration will prove to be difficult, if not impossible, to explain by any other model. A fundamental objection to the Saturn theory. The most obvious objection to the Saturn theory is its apparent incompatibility with conventional astrophysics. This is indeed a formidable objection, one deserving of serious attention and ultimately a valid answer, ideally in terms of offering a viable physical model for the polar configuration. While promising steps towards achieving a viable physical model have been achieved, the models of Grubal and Driscoll, for example, such attempts have thus far proved preliminary and only partly successful. Much work remains to be done in this area. 
preferably by scientists trained in the requisite fields of astronomy, physics, and mechanics. Personally, I remain confident that an answer will be found if for no other reason than it is highly improbable that a theory with so much historical evidence in its favor could prove entirely illusory. If the history of science teaches us anything, it is there is ample precedent for reserving judgment on a historical thesis well supported by evidence but lacking a viable physical model. Darwin's theory of evolution, to take a particularly notorious example, languished for decades under the objection that it lacked a viable model of heredity, which could explain how the much-needed genetic changes could originate and come to be fixed rather than blended as per earlier models of heredity. Already by the time of Darwin, there was a wealth of evidence that evolution had occurred. How else are we to explain the fact that Modern whales occasionally show traces of vestigial hind limbs and hip girdles, but a viable model of heredity was not yet at hand, to say nothing of a chemical model for genetic mutation or embryonic differentiation. Even today, well over a hundred years later, many of the most fundamental questions surrounding the biochemical mechanisms of evolution remains unanswerable. We still have little understanding of how the various phyla originated or why some species proved successful while others became extinct. In the meantime, however, while modern biology awaits a solution to these truly perplexing and formidable mysteries, no informed scientist can doubt the historical reality that biological evolution has occurred. The question is how did life evolve and by what precise means? A similar situation surrounds the Saturn theory in my opinion. Here too the historical evidence is unequivocal that various planets once participated in a polar configuration and wreaked havoc with the inner solar system. The question is how are we to understand these tumultuous historical events from the standpoint of physics? F. Cochran the one biggest hurdle for me is how could how could the ancients worship these bloodthirsty killers they got when it would be a speck in the sky that takes 29 years to orbit the sun as they say that dog don't hunt that is the biggest conundrum of all and also all the worldwide iconography and it's all still with us today it's amazing how much saturn is in our culture all right that'll do it for me thank you for all of you that have donated and please like share and comment on this video so more people can see it take care i'll see you on down the road
there's as you see we read with different eyes with different minds we are in a state of a victim of amnesia a humankind is a victim of amnesia and a victim of amnesia does not act responsibly he acts irrationally If he comes into conjunction with Saturn, it means the holy books, that is, Judaism, which is older than the others, just as Saturn is the father of the planets. If Jupiter comes into conjunction with Mars, it means the Chaldean law, which teaches the worship of fire. If it is with the sun, it means the Egyptian law, which means that one worships the celestial army led by the sun. If with Venus, it means the law of the Saracens, which is pleasure-loving and lascivious. And if it is with Mercury, the mercurial law, which is Christianity, until, at last, the law of the moon will come to disturb it, and that is the sect of the Antichrist. It should be mentioned that this theory would later be explicitly rejected by Ficino on account of its overly deterministic character. In Picatrix, however, each of the planets have their own respective religions to govern, but the planet-to-religion breakdown differs somewhat from that of Abu Mashar's Great Conjunction Scheme. Picatrix's breakdown is as follows. Saturn, Judaism. Jupiter, Christianity. Mars, heresy and apostasy. The Sun, paganism or Sabaeanism. Venus, Islam. Mercury, philosophy, materialism and skepticism and the moon, those who worship idols and images. What the theory of great conjunctions and Picatrix do have in common, however, is the fundamental association between Saturn and the Jews. Here, by virtue of their mutual antiquity, both the Hebrew and Chaldean tongues are kept under Saturn's jurisdiction. Astrology was no mere tabloid trifle or isolated discipline during this era. To use the words of Eugenio Garin, the Middle Ages were greatly concerned with, quote, astrology and religion, astrology and politics, astrology and propaganda, but also astrology and medicine, astrology and science, a philosophy of history, a conception of reality a fatalistic naturalism, and an astral cult. Astrology was all these and more." End quote. What came to a head in the Italian Renaissance was the sheer volume of all these different astrological ideas, with all their internal contrasts and contradictions, building up to what Thomas Kuhn would describe as the crisis preceding the paradigm shift. And all this was happening precisely while the Studia Humanitatis began remapping these astral deities with imagery drawn up from the classics. One curious element of this fascination with astrology and culture was what Moshe Idel called the Saturnization of Judaism and in turn the Judaization of Saturn. 
by the end of this process, in the late 15th and 16th centuries, even European Jewish Kabbalists like Yohanan Alamano, working from earlier Spanish or Sephardic sources, were expressing the astromagical link between ancient history, the land of Israel, Moses, the temple, the Torah, prophetic inspiration, the Sabbath, and esoteric knowledge with Saturn. I will read you a fairly extensive quote by Johanan Alamano right here. Uh, this is from an untitled treatise on the Sephirot of Binah. And the third sphere, that of Saturn, is a supreme and noble one, higher than all the other planets, which is the reason that the ancient sages said about it that it generated all the other planets. And they say that Saturn is the true judge and the planet of Moses, peace be with him. The angel of Saturn is Michael, the great minister, so called because of his great power in divine matters, and he is the ministering angel of Israel. And the astrologers who have described Saturn say that it endows man with profound thought, law, and the spiritual sciences, the chokmot ruhaniot, prophecy, nevoah, sorcery, kishuf, prognostication, and the shemitot and yovelot. The Jewish people and the Hebrew language and the temple are under its jurisdiction. Saturn's major conjunction is with Jupiter in the dominion of Pisces and occurs to assist the nation and the Torah and its prophets. This planet endows the people with perfection in sciences and divine matters such as the Torah and its commandments, out of its sublimity because it is spiritual. It is concerned only with thought, understanding, and design, esoteric knowledge, and divine worship, and his Torah, and the Sabbath day is in its sway, because its nature causes material existence to cease, and all the operations that do not correspond to it are forbidden, because it corrupts and destroys all destructions. And lightning, that is fire, should not be done under its aegis, that is, during the Sabbath, because it is cold. And if they keep its spiritual rules and laws, it will impart a spiritual influx abundantly. But if they do not keep the way of God, it will spit forth everything that is bad. Prophecy will occur to fools and to babes in an insufficient manner, and to women and to melancholics, and to those possessed by an evil spirit and maleficent demons that obliterate the limbs, and bad counsels and sorceries and anxieties and erroneous beliefs. So Idel takes this passage to represent the Saturnization of Judaism as inspired by the writings of the Toledan rabbi Abraham ibn Ezra, whose dates are 1089 to 1164, but also to his circle of commentators. This he does on account of its numerous parallels with the passages that follow here, and it's quite possible that his description of the links between Saturn and Judaism were also shaped by an acquaintance with the Picatrix in one of its forms, whether directly or indirectly. So.
Maybe it's now. Where is it? Electric Sun Hypothesis The Basics In this day and age, there is no longer any doubt that electric effects in plasmas play an important role in the phenomena we observe on the Sun. The major properties of the Electric Sun ES model are as follows. Most of the space within our galaxy is occupied by plasma, rarefied ionized gas containing electrons, negative charges, and ionized atoms, positive charges. Every charged particle in the plasma has an electric potential energy, voltage, just as every pebble on a mountain has a mechanical potential energy with respect to sea level. The sun is at the center of a plasma cell called the heliosphere that stretches far out several times the radius of Pluto. As of 9-9-2012, the radius of this plasma cell has been measured to be greater than 18 billion kilometers, or 122 times the distance from the Sun to Earth. These are facts, not hypotheses. The Sun is at a more positive electrical potential voltage than is the space plasma surrounding it, probably in the order of several thousand volts. Positive ions leave the sun, electrons enter the sun. Both of these flows add to form a net positive current flowing through the sun, entering at the poles and leaving radially at lower latitudes. This constitutes a plasma discharge, analogous in every way except size to those that have been observed in electrical plasma laboratories for decades. Because of the sun's positive charge, voltage, it acts as the anode in a plasma discharge. As such, it exhibits many of the phenomena observed in earthbound plasma laboratory experiments. The sun may be powered not from within itself, but from outside, by the electric Birkeland currents that flow in our arm of our galaxy, as they do in all galaxies. This possibility that the sun may be externally powered by its galactic environment is the most speculative idea in the ES hypothesis, and 
is always attacked by critics, while they completely ignore all the other obvious properties of the ES model. In the plasma universe, is high. An electrically powered sun's radiated power would be due to the energy delivered by that amperage. As it travels around the galactic center, the sun may come into regions of higher or lower current density, and so its output may vary, both periodically and randomly. The Corona The sun's corona is visible only during solar eclipses, or via sophisticated instruments developed for that specific purpose. It is a vast, luminous plasma glow that changes shape with time, always remaining fairly smooth and distributed in its inner regions, and showing filamentary spikes and points in its outer fringes. It is a glow-mode plasma discharge. If the sun were not electrical in nature, this corona would not exist. If the sun is simply a non-electrical nuclear furnace, the corona has no business being there at all. So one of the most basic questions that ought to arise in any discussion of the sun is, why does our sun have a corona? Why is it there? It serves no purpose in a fusion-only model. Nor can such models explain its existence. The solar wind. Positive ions stream outward from the sun's surface and accelerate away through the corona for as far as we have been able to measure. It is thought that these particles eventually make up a portion of the cosmic ray flux that permeates the cosmos. The wind varies with time and has even been observed to stop completely for a period of a day or two. What causes this fluctuation? The ES model proposes a simple explanation and suggests a mechanism that both creates and controls fluctuations in its flow. The standard model provides no such explanation or mechanism. See Solar Surface Transistor Action Electrical Properties of the Photosphere and the Chromosphere The essence of the electric sun hypothesis is a description of the electrical properties of its photosphere, chromosphere, and the resulting effects on the charged particles that move through those layers. The surface of the sun that we typically see from Earth is the photosphere, which is a brightly radiating layer of plasma only about 500 kilometers thick. It is analogous to the anode glow region of a laboratory gas discharge experiment, except that it is in arc mode. It consists of cells of plasma, sometimes called tufts or granules. Sunspots are areas where no such granules exist. The granules observed on the surface of the photosphere are in fairly turbulent motion. They change shape, size, and disappear in a matter of hours or days. New ones pop up in their place. The anode glow is often observed in the laboratory to consist of a pattern of small, rotating, regularly arranged spots whose speed of rotation is sometimes sufficiently slow to be followed by the unaided eye. The analogy between the laboratory gas discharge and the behavior of the sun is indeed a compelling one. The photosphere then is plasma in the arc mode. We say this because the sun emits power at a rate of over 63 million watts per square meter from its photospheric surface. This is equivalent to a power output of 40 kilowatts from each square inch of that surface. 
Some have questioned whether the photosphere's relatively low temperature, about 5,800 Kelvin, disqualifies it from being in arc mode. In 1944, C.E.R. Bruce of England's Electrical Research Institute proposed that the photosphere has the appearance, the temperature, and the spectrum of an electric arc. It has arc characteristics because it is an electric arc, or a large number of arcs in parallel, and it is difficult to imagine a plasma discharge in anything other than arc mode that could radiate 40 kilowatts of power from each square inch of its surface area. A cross-section taken from a photospheric granule is shown in the three plots shown together below in figure one. The horizontal axis is distance, measured radially outward, upward, starting at a point near the bottom of the photosphere. The true surface of the sun, which we can only observe in the umbra of sunspots, almost every observed property of the sun can be explained through reference to these three plots. For this reason, much of the discussion that follows makes reference to them. The first plot shows the energy per unit, positive charge, of an ion as a function of its distance out from, altitude up from, the solar surface. The units of energy per unit charge are volts, V. The second plot, the E field, shows the outward upward radial force toward the right in this figure. Experienced by each such positive ion. The third plot shows the locations of the charge densities that will produce the, the first two plots. The chromosphere is the location of a plasma double layer, DL, of electrical charge. Recall that one of the properties of electric plasma is its excellent, although not perfect, conductivity. Such an excellent conductor will support only a weak electric field. Notice in the second plot that the almost ideal plasmas of the photosphere, region B to C, and the corona from point E outward are regions of almost zero electric field strength. End of part one. When we consider the sun, however, spherical geometry exists with the sun at the center. The cross-section becomes an imaginary sphere. Assume a constant total electron drift moving from all directions toward the sun and a constant total redial flow of positive ions outward. Imagine a spherical surface of large radius through which this total current passes. As we approach the sun, from deep space. This spherical surface has an ever-decreasing area. Therefore, for a fixed total current, the current density, A over M squared, increases as we move inward toward the sun. The anode surface of the sun is a tiny fraction of the area of, virtual, of the virtual cathode, the area of the heliopause. According to the latest measurements, the surface area of the heliopause is 653 million times larger than the surface area of the sun. Thus, current density at the sun's surface will be 653 million times what it is at the heliopause cathode. In deep space, say just inside the heliopause, the current density there is extremely low, even though the current may be huge. We are in the dark current region. There are no glowing gases. 
nothing to tell us we are in a plasma discharge, except possibly some radio frequency emissions. We get closer to the sun, the spherical boundary has a smaller, decreasing surface area. The current density increases. We enter the normal glow region. This is what we call the sun's outer corona. The intensity of the radiated light is much like a neon sign. The volt amper plot has negative slope and so filaments form. Filaments are often clearly observed in the outer corona. Those filaments may indeed be Berkman currents. As we approach still closer to the sun, the spherical boundary gets to be only slightly larger of the radiated light. It is much like an arc welding machine or a motion picture projector. A high intensity ultraviolet light is emitted. It is well known that if the anode in a discharge is much smaller than the cathode, and the photosphere exists on the sun. The boundary between the corona, glow mode, plasma, and the photosphere, arc mode, is a double layer, GL. This phenomenon is often observed in laboratory plasma experiments. Some early plasma researchers and most modern astronomers believe that the only true plasma is one that is perfectly conductive and so will freeze magnetic fields into itself. This is the erroneous theoretical basis of magnetic reconnection. The volt amper plot shown above indicates that this does not happen. Every point on the plot, except the origin, Obviously, the static resistivity of a plasma in the high zero static resistivity, it takes it has a non-zero static resistivity. It takes a non-zero E field to produce the current density. Obviously, the static resistivity of a plasma in the high end of the dark mode can be quite large. The arc region region and the left half of the glow region exhibit negative dynamic resistance, and the E field can be quite small. But that is not what is in question. No real plasma can freeze in a magnetic field. The highest conductivity plasmas are those in the arc mode. But even in that mode, it takes a finite non-zero valued electric field to produce current density. No plasma is an ideal superconductor. Figure 1 energy, electric field strength, and charge density as a function of radial distance from the sun's surface. The energy plot shown above in the photo is valid for positively charged particles because a positive E field represents an outward radial force toward the right per unit charge on any such particle. The region wherein the E field is negative A to B constitutes an inward force. This region of the lower photosphere is thus an energy barrier. The positive ions must surmount in order to escape the body of the sun. Any ions attempting to escape outward from within the sun must have enough energy to get over this energy barrier. So the presence of this single positive charge layer at the bottom of the photospheric plasma serves as a constraint on unlimited escape of ions on the surface of the sun. Granule shrinkage in movement. In order to visualize the effect this energy diagram has on electrons, negative charges coming in toward the sun from cosmic space from the right, we can turn the energy plot upside down. Doing this enables us to visualize the trap that these photospheric granules are for incoming electrons. As the trap fills, the energy of the granule existing between B and C decreases in height, and so the granule weakens, shrinks, and eventually disappears. This is the cause of the observed shrinkage and disappearance of the photospheric granule.
temperature minimum. If the standard model were correct, heat and light would simply radiate away from the photosphere as from a hot stove. Temperature measurements would monotonically decrease with distance. But many processes, other than simple radiation of heat, are occurring above the photosphere. A temperature minimum of about 4100 Kelvin occurs just above the photosphere. The lower region of the sun's corona at much higher altitude are millions of degrees hotter than the surface of the sun itself. How can this be? The standard model has no satisfactory explanation. The electric sun hypothesis explains it clearly as follows. Charged particles do not experience external electrostatic forces when they are in the range B to C within the photosphere. Only random thermal movement occurs due to diffusion. Temperature is simply the measurement of the violence of such random movement. This is where the about 6,000 Kelvin photospheric temperature is measured. Positive ions have their maximum electrical potential energy when they are in this photospheric granule plasma. But their mechanical kinetic energy is relatively low. At a point just to the left of point C, any random movement toward the right, radially outward, upward, that carries a positive ion, even slightly beyond point C, will result in its being swept away, down the energy hill, out of the sun. Such movement of charged particles, due to an E field, is called a drift current. This drift current of accelerating positive ions is a constituent of the solar wind, which is a serious misnomer. As positive ions begin to accelerate down the potential energy drop from point C through point E, they convert the high electrical potential energy they had in the photosphere into kinetic energy. They gain extremely high outward radial velocity and lose side-to-side -side random motion. Thus, they become dethermalized. In this region, in the upper photosphere and the chromosphere, the movement of these ions becomes extremely organized, parallel. Therefore, an observed temperature minimum occurs here. The transition zone. Rapidly moving positive ions past point E, they leave the chromosphere. They move beyond the radial outward directed E field force that has been accelerating them. Because of their high kinetic energy velocity, any collisions they have at this point with other ions or neutral atoms are violent and create high amplitude random motion, thereby re-thermalizing the plasma to a much greater degree than it was in the photospheric granule. This is what is responsible for the high temperature we observe in the lower corona. Ions just to the right of point E are reported to be at temperatures of 1 to 2 million Kelvin. Nothing else but exactly this kind of mechanism could be expected from the electric sun photospheric double layer model. The rethermalization takes place in a region analogous to the turbulent white water boiling at the bottom of a smooth laminar water slide. Hmm? In the fusion model, no such accelerating water slide mechanism exists, and so neither does a simple explanation of the temperature discontinuity. Cosmic rays. The particles in our solar wind eventually join with the spent solar winds of all the other stars in our galaxy to make up the total cosmic ray flux in our arm of the galaxy. Jurgens points out that the sun is a rather mediocre star as far as radiating energy goes. If it is electrically powered, perhaps its mediocrity is attributed to a relatively unimpressive driving potential. This would mean that hotter, more luminous stars 
should have driving potentials greater than that of the sun, and should consequently expel cosmic rays of greater energies than solar cosmic rays. A star with a driving potential of 20 billion volts would expel protons energetic enough to reach the sun's surface, consequently expel cosmic rays of greater energies than solar cosmic rays, arriving with 10 billion electron volts of energy to spare. Such cosmic ions, when they collide with Earth's upper atmosphere, release the muon neutrinos. Muon neutrinos. That have been in the news recently. Hans Elfain, in his book, The New Astronomy, Chapter 2, Section 3, page 74 to 79, said about cosmic rays, how these particles are driven to their fantastic energies, sometimes as high as a million billion electron volts, is one of the prime puzzles of astronomy. No known or even unknown nuclear reaction could account for the firing of particles of such energies. Even the complete annihilation of a proton would not yield more than a billion electron volts. Fluctuations in the solar wind. It is interesting to note in passing that the three plots presented in figure one are identically the plots of energy, E-field, and charge distribution found in a junction transistor. Of course, in that solid state device, there are different processes going on at different energy levels. Valence band and conduction band. Within a solid crystal, in the solar plasma, there are no fixed atomic centers, and so there is only one energy band in a transistor. The amplitude of the collector current, analogous to the drift of positive ions in the solar wind toward the right, is easily controlled by raising and lowering the difference between the base and emitter voltages. Is the same mechanism a voltage fluctuation between the anode sun and its photosphere granules at work in the sun? E.g., if the sun's voltage were to decrease slightly, say because of an excessive flow of outgoing positive ions, negative the voltage rise from point A to point B in the energy diagram would increase in height and so reduce the solar wind, both the inward electron flow and the outward positive ion flow, in a compensating negative feedback effect. In May of 1999, the solar wind completely cut off for about two days. There are also periodic variations in the solar wind. The transistor-like mechanism described above is certainly capable of causing these phenomena. The fusion model is at a complete loss to explain them, whereas transistor cutoff is well-known electronic mechanism that is used in all digital circuits. Characteristic modes of plasma. In the page on electric plasma on this website, the three characteristic static modes in which a plasma can operate are discussed. Here is a somewhat more exact description. We need this to explain the detailed properties we observe on the sun's surface. The static volt ampere characteristic of a typical laboratory plasma discharge inside a cylindrical chamber has the shape shown below in the current picture. So the sun acts like a transistor, that's interesting. And crystals are in transistors. Fusion in the double layer. The Z-pinch effect of high-intensity parallel current filaments in an arc plasma is very strong. Whatever nuclear fusion is taking place on the sun is probably occurring here in the double layer, DL, at the top of the photosphere, not deep within the core. The result of this fusion process are the metals that give rise to absorption lines in the sun spectrum. Traces of 68 of the 92 natural elements are found in the sun's atmosphere. Most of the radio frequency noise emitted by the sun emanates from this region. Radio noise is a well-known property of double layers. The electrical power available to be delivered to the plasma at any point 
is the product of the E field, V over M, times current density, A over M to the second. This multiplication operation yields watts per cubic meter, power density. The current density is relatively constant over the height of the photospheric chromospheric layers. However, the E field is at its strongest at the center of the double layer. Present thinking is that nuclear fusion takes a great deal of power. If that is so, then the power is available in the double layer. It has reportedly been observed the neutrino flux from the sun varies inversely with sunspot number. This is expected in the ES hypothesis because the source of those neutrinos is probably Z-pinch produced fusion which is occurring in the double layer. And sunspots are locations where there is no double layer in which this process can occur. The greater the number of sunspots, the fewer the number of observed solar neutrinos. Sunspots. In the plasma of the photosphere, both the dimensions of and the voltage within the granules depend on the current density at that location near the sun's anode surface. The existence of the double layer of electric charge associated with each granule separating it from the corona plasma above it requires a certain numerical relationship between positive ion and electron numbers in the total current. This required ratio of electron to ion motion was discovered, quantified, and reported by Irving Langmuir over 50 years ago. Spicules, tall jets of electrons that emanate from the boundaries between the granules, supply many of those needed electrons. In this electric sun model, as with any plasma discharge, the granular cells disappear wherever the flux of incoming electrons impinging into a given area of the sun's anode surface is not sufficiently strong to require the augmentation of anode size they provide. At any such location, the photospheric cells collapse, as we can see down the actual anode surface of the sun. Since there is no arc mode plasma discharge occurring in these locations, they appear darker than the surrounding area and are termed sunspot umbrae. Of course, if a tremendous amount of energy were actually being produced in the sun's interior, these umbrae should be brighter and hotter than the surrounding photosphere. The fact that sunspot umbrae are dark and relatively cool, 3 to 4,000 Kelvin or 22, 27, 27 to 42, 27 Celsius, strongly supports the condition that very little, if anything, in the way of heat production is going on in the sun's interior. The Sun, Part 3. Figure 3, a sunspot showing the umbra, penumbra, and surrounding granular cells. The top plot in Figure 1 shows the electrical potential energy of a positive ion in the sun's atmosphere. This diagram is expanded and reproduced below in Figure 4 and is relabeled to show the energies, voltage levels, at different locations in the vicinity of a sunspot. In Figure 3, normal bright yellow arc mode. Solar granules appear around the periphery of a typical sunspot. They are at voltage level one half in figure four. Typically in these normal granules, positive ions flow upward, directly out toward the viewer in figure three. In figure four, such ions have enough energy to make the journey from the interior of the sun left of the origin, marked as A on the horizontal axis, up over the voltage rise from A to B, they diffuse across the region B to C, and fall down the potential hill from C to E. 
At this point, these rapidly moving ions create the turbulence observed as the high 2 million Kelvin temperatures seen in the lower corona. In figure 3, this, this journey takes such an ion up out of the sun's interior, up through a granule, and accelerates it out vertically upward. These ions then continue outward as the major constituent of what is called the solar wind. We must be aware of what figure 4 represents. The black locus indicates a voltage A positive ion would experience along its journey upward out of the sun's body through the photospheric granule and upward into the lower corona. Penumbral filaments. But what about the penumbra, those strangely shaped plasma filaments, cells surrounding the umbra? that remind us of the iris of a human eye. Starting just inside the sun's body, some ions have barely enough kinetic energy to leave the body of the sun by rising up to a voltage level V2 or greater. In the altitude range B to C in figure four, where they are diffusing upward, some of these ions may collide with other ions or neutral atoms, and some of them may be given a diffusion velocity that bounces them back downward toward the left in figure four. If they diffuse in the direction beyond point B, they will be attracted back down into the sun. In 3D space, they may just sink out the bottom of the granule or fall off its side into the darker channels that surround each granule. Or, if they are close enough to the edge of a sunspot, they may fall into it. That is what we are seeing in the penumbral filaments, shown in figures 3 and 5. The process is analogous to icebergs calving off from glaciers to which they have been attached. The tops of the granules near the umbra's edge peel off, bend downward toward the umbra, and fall toward the lower voltage and lower altitude surface of the sun visible in the umbra. Yeah, it's interesting. The interior of the sun is, is obviously rocky. Prominences, flares, and CMEs. All of the above discussion applies to the steady state, or almost I'd steady state, iron. operation of the electric sun. There are several dynamic phenomena, such as flares, prominences, and coronal mass ejections, CMEs, that we observe. How are they produced? Nobel laureate Hans Alfane, although not aware of the Jurgens electric sun model, advanced his own theory of how prominences in solar flares are formed electrically. It is completely consistent with the Jurgens model. Any electric current, I, creates a magnetic field. The stronger the current, the stronger the magnetic field, and the more energy it contains. Curved magnetic fields cannot exist without either electrical currents or time-varying electric fields. Energy, Wm, stored in any magnetic field is given by the expression Wm equals one half Li squared. One half Li squared. If the current I is interpreted, the field collapses and its energy must be delivered somewhere. The magnetic field of the sun sometimes, and in some places on its surface, forms an omega-shaped loop. This loop extends out through the double sheath layer, DL, of the chromosphere. I need to drink water. One of the primary properties of Birkeland currents is that they generally follow magnetic field lines. A strong looping current will produce a secondary toroidal magnetic field that will surround and try to expand the loop. If the current following the loop becomes too strong, the double layer will be destroyed. This interrupts the current, like opening the switch in an inductive circuit, and the energy stored in the primary magnetic field is explosively released into space. It should be well understood, certainly by anyone who has had a basic physics course, that the magnetic field lines that are drawn to describe a magnetic field have no beginning nor end. They are closed paths. In fact, one of Maxwell's famous equation is DIVB equals zero. DIVB equals zero which says exactly that in the language of vector differential calculus. So when magnetic fields collapse due to the interruption of the currents, they produce them. They do not break or merge or recombine, as some uninformed astronomers have postulated. The field simply collapses very quickly on the sun. This collapse can release a tremendous amount of energy, and matter is thrown away 
from the surface. As with any explosively rapid reaction, this release is consistent with and predicted by the electric sun model as described above. That is how coronal mass ejections, CMEs, occur. Note that although astronomers ought to be aware that magnetic fields require electrical currents or time-varying E-fields to produce them, currents and E-fields are almost never mentioned in standard models. Conclusion This rather lengthy page has actually been the briefest of introductions to Jurgen's electric sun model. The realization that our sun functions electrically, that it is a huge electrically charged, relatively quiescent. quiescent sphere of ionized gas that supports an electric plasma arc discharge on its surface and is probably powered by subtle currents that move throughout the now well-known tenuous. tenuous plasma that fills our galaxy. A more detailed description of the ES hypothesis as well as the deficiencies of the standard solar fusion model are presented in the electric sky. Today's orthodox thermonuclear model fails to explain many observed solar phenomena. The electric sun model is inherently predictive of most, if not all, these observed phenomena. It is relatively simple. It is self-consistent. And it does not require the existence of mysterious entities, such as the unseen solar dynamo genie that lurks somewhere beneath the surface of the fusion model and serves as a fallback explanation for all observations that are inconvenient for the accepted fusion model. Ralph Jurgens had the genius to develop the electric sun model back in the 1970s. He based it on the work of others who went before him. His hypothesis and modern extensions of it have so far passed the harsh test of observed reality. They have passed several tests to which the Sapphire Laboratory team have subjected it. This seminal work may eventually get the recognition it deserves. Or, of course, others may try to claim it or parts of it and hope the world forgets who came up with these ideas first. There is now enough inescapable evidence that a majority of the phenomena we observe on the sun are fundamentally electric in nature. Ralph Jurgens had the vision to recognize that. Don Scott. Have you ever hit a cart and then blew it out of your nose and it just burns so bad you can't stand it? Oh, what was I thinking? Venetian pentagram can be found 
superimposed upon the disk of Shamash, figure 12. The Sun and Venus in Mesoamerica. Worship of the ancient sun god in the planet Venus is as conspicuous in the New World as it is in the Old. Each of the so-called solar images can be found in prehistoric petroglyphs, as can the eight-pointed star and pentagram. In most cases, of course, New World petroglyphs occur in contexts otherwise devoid of writing, and thus it is difficult to be certain which celestial body is the subject of the glyph. Such is not the case in Mesoamerica, however, which reached a high stage of civilization under the Olmec and Maya. In addition to developing a sophisticated system of writing, the Maya were also skilled astronomers capable of calculating the period of Venus to within a fraction of its true value. Early symbols and petrographs of Mesoamerica consequently provide an invaluable key to unlocking the secrets of celestial imagery in prehistoric rock art. A prominent characteristic of Mesoamerican astronomy, indeed of Mesoamerican culture in general, was an obsession with the planet Venus. Like their counterparts in ancient Babylon, Mesoamerican sky watchers chronicled the movements of Venus with amazing diligence and accuracy, viewing it as an agent of great omen and danger. Of the Mexican preoccupation with Venus, a Spanish monk was led to report so accurately did they keep the record of the days when it appeared and disappeared that they never made a mistake. It would be difficult to cite an aspect of Mesoamerican culture devoid of the planet's influence. Temples were constructed and aligned with the purpose of gaining the optimum view of the planet. Various rituals, including human sacrifices and the practices of war, were timed to correspond to important aspects of the planet's orbit. Even the calendar was designed to take into account the planet's movements. Anywhere the sacred iconography associated with Venus abounds. The omnipresent influence of Venus upon Mesoamerican culture invites comparison with Old World cultures, particularly that of Babylon. And as we have documented elsewhere, the two cultures share much in common with respect to the sacred traditions and iconography surrounding the planet Venus. Among the Maya and Aztecs, for example, Venus was represented as a star. This was in keeping with its name, Great Star, a common epithet of the planet amongst the various peoples in Mesoamerica. Figure 13a depicts an Aztec symbol for Venus. This figure bears comparison with the four-pointed star which adorns the disk of Shamash. In figure 6, the resemblance is striking, down to and including the central point within the fourfold star. It is even possible that the volutes which distinguish the Aztec glyph correspond with the wavy lines which emanate from behind the star in the Babylonian symbol. The resemblance between the Aztec symbol and the Mesopotamian, needless to say, supports the conclusion that the four-pointed star originated in the objective appearance of the planet Venus. The same basic image is apparent in figure 13b, a version of the Lamet glyph, an acknowledged Maya glyph for Venus. Here the star is set against a circular disk, not unlike that associated with Shamash, as figure 13b and figure 13c, and then there was figure 6. It is equally common, however, to find Venus depicted as a five-pointed star. See figure 13c. Here too, the Mesoamerican symbol finds a close counterpart in the Babylonian cult of Ishtar, Venus. Figure 12. Figure 12, right there. Quincunx. The Quincunx. As was the case in the ancient Near East, pictographs featured prominently in Mesoamerican systems of writing included among the earliest petroglyphs is one believed to be associated with the planet Venus. See figure 14. Commonly known as quincunx from the appearance of four circles about a central orb. 
and he has been said the quincunx is the most frequently occurring sign in the Mesoamerican symbolic language. And like the star in Mesopotamian iconography, the quincunx appears ubiquitously amongst the sacred iconography surrounding the planet Venus. Given the Maya's renowned obsession with heavenly phenomena, it is not surprising that other celestial objects also came to be represented on their sacred stele and imposing stone monuments. The sun, for example, was commonly signified by a glyph known as the kin. See figure 15. Of the kin glyph, Thompson opined that it was probably derived from some type of four-petaled flower. It is not uncommon, however, to find the quincunx sign superimposed upon the kin sign. See figure 16. Of the meaning of this surprising superimposition of glyphs, Thompson offers nary a clue only the following observation. The quincunx is frequently set on the regular four-petaled kin glyph, apparently without altering its, uh, its value in any way. The reader will recognize at once, of course, that this is the very same situation we encountered in ancient symbols from the old world. Again, we ask, what could possibly be the significance of this bizarre convergence of iconography, whereby the sign of Venus is placed upon the sign of the sun? Archaeal astronomers, confronted with this evidence from ancient hieroglyphs, might well be tempted to suggest that early scribes were trying to illustrate some important celestial event, such as the inferior conjunction of Venus and the Sun. The latter is an event recurring every 584 days or so in which Venus passes directly between the Earth and the Sun. Unfortunate for the hypothetical thesis, however, is the fact that Venus is invisible during inferior conjunction, and thus this would appear to be a most unlikely explanation of, of the glyphs in question. Another possibility, of course, is to assume that modern scholars have erred in their identification of the glyphs for the Sun and Venus. This, too, is highly unlikely, at least with regard to the sign for Venus. What, then, can be the explanation for the glyphs in question? The position taken in this essay accepts the ancient signs at face value as fateful, albeit some somewhat rudimentary attempts to depict a celestial phenomenon in which Venus appeared to be superimposed against the backdrop of a much larger sun-like orb. Those readers familiar with previous essays of Talbot and myself will recognize here a familiar theme. Summary. In the present essay, we have documented that glaring anomalies distinguish the earliest iconography associated with the various celestial bodies. Prehistoric petroglyphs from around the world consistently portray the ancient sun god in a fashion that bears little resemblance to the appearance of the current solar orb. Among the most common petroglyphs are those which show the solar disk equipped with a central dot, an eight-spoked body, a rosette, and a pillar-like appendage. The fact that the very same images appear amongst the earliest pictographs in Samaria, Egypt, and Mesoamerica not only confirms the stubborn longevity of these sacred images, it offers some justification for the view that a continuity of beliefs, e.g. astral worship, likewise underlies the common images, thereby offering hope of discovering the original significance of the prehistoric petroglyphs upon analysis of their historical counterparts. In Mesopotamia, as we have seen, the most ancient symbol of Shamash, depicted as a star upon a circular disk, the star, however, originally signified the planet Venus not only in Mesopotamia, but also in Mesoamerica and Egypt. In light of the fact that the Babylonians and Maya are renowned for their astronomical prowess, particularly as it applied to the observation of Venus, we would venture forth the opinion that the stellar iconography surrounding this planet was representative in nature and thus reflected the objective appearance of Venus in prehistoric times. How then are we to explain the presence of the Venus star upon the disk of the sun? At the very least, this juxtaposition of images suggests a hitherto unnoticed relationship between the planet Venus and the Sun. Difficult to explain, given the current relationship which pertains between these two bodies, more probably these images allude to a lost solar system, one in which the planet Venus appeared to be superimposed upon a Sun-like orb the latter to be distinguished from the current solar orb. Support for this conclusion can be obtained upon further analysis of the prehistoric sun images. Certainly, there is a remarkable resemblance between the Venusian star in figure 8a and the eight-spoked body adorning the sun disk. In figure 4, indeed, it is the opinion of this author 
that the eight-spoked body in figure four does in fact represent the planet Venus, and thus marks a prehistoric analog of the eight-pointed star in which adorns the symbol of Shamash in figure seven. Nor is it difficult to recognize a certain affinity between the rosette in figure nine and the flower-like object adorning the solar disk in figure three. That the rosette was one of the oldest symbols of Inanna Venus is commonly acknowledged as its intimate relationship to the eight-pointed star. As we have seen, the eight-pointed star is frequently depicted as little more than eight arms or spokes emanating from a central hub, figure 10. And some early examples of the star, such as that from Elam depicted in figure 8b, render the resemblance to the Venusian rosette readily apparent. Indeed, the resemblance extends to the finest details of the respective images. Witness the dark dot located within the innermost core of the star, found not only in figures 3 and 8b, but also within various examples of figure 2 and 13. Having discussed the images represented by figures 3 and 4, it remains to discuss figure 2, the most common petroglyph of the sun, and one of the most prominent images in all of ancient art. Figure 5 will be dealt with at length in a subsequent essay. If we are to be consistent, the smaller orb is to be identified with the planet Venus. That the same body may at one time be represented as a star and elsewhere as an eye-like orb upon the face of the sun god need not be a contradiction. In ancient times, perhaps, the planet went through cyclical phases, not unlike our current moon, which alternately presents the appearance of a crescent and a circular disk. More probably, the different images associated with the planet Venus represent different stages in the evolutionary history of the planet, particularly as it related to the planet's interaction with the ancient sun god and other bodies in the solar system. It can be shown, in fact, that the planet Venus underwent various metamorphoses, metamorphoses in appearance during its long-term association with the ancient sun god. During the course of the past decade, Talbot and myself have discussed several of the more clearly delineated phases in the history of Venus. Among the most prominent, as we have documented in great detail, is the phase in which Venus was identified with the eye of the sun god. Thus, it is that Venus is identified with an eye, or with the eye of the ancient sun god. Throughout the ancient world, in ancient Egypt, to take the most familiar example of this motive, the eye of Ra, one of the most sacred objects in all of Egyptian religion, is identified with Venus and the glyph for Ra. It may be remembered is our figure too. Conclusion. Together with the polychrome paintings of bison and mammoths on the cave walls at Altamira, ancient images of the sun and planets, Venus provide compelling evidence of lost worlds. The hypothesis that Venus moved upon a radically different orbit in very recent times, during the Neolithic age, perhaps, will no doubt be met with the same skepticism as which greeted the discovery of the Paleolithic cave paintings in the past century. Be that as it may, the testimony of ancient rock art is not to be explained away. Indeed, it is our opinion that the evolutionary history of the solar system can be reconstructed in great detail upon analysis of ancient iconography and mythology, like the ancient oracle at Delphi. The mysterious images engraved in stone call out to us, with news of the ancient gods. But given the cynical nature of the modern world, who among us will listen? Ev Cochran. Carl Sagan, an analysis of worlds in collision. And D. Goldsmith, Scientists confront Velikovsky, New York, 1979. That's silly. That just wait for them to make themselves feel better. Two, Velikovsky, Worlds in Collision, 1950. See a discussion with A. Wilcox, The Rock Art of Africa, Kent, 1984. Close parallels can be found in East Tawahig, Tuig, the Megalithic Art of Western Europe, Oxford, 1981. On the age of these petroglyphs, Anadi writes, the most ancient valley carvings dealing with sun worship belong to the end of the Stone Age, to the second half of the third millennium BC. At that period, the sun is drawn as an isolated disk. Seldom it is accompanied by a person with hands upraised in an attitude of prayer. He's got 
74 references here, so it's quite a lot. I'll read a couple of them. The origin of Velikovsky's Comet, Kronos, Fall 1984. On the nature of cometary symbolism, Kronos, Fall 1985, when Venus was a comet, 1987, Dave Talbot. Mother Goddess and Warrior Hero, Eon, 1988. The mythical, the mythical history of the comet Venus, Eon, 1991, Bev Cochran. On Comets and Kings, Eon, 1989, The Birth of Athena. Well, you can get that information right from here. Significantly, Venus was also compared to a flower in the New World. Thus, a Maya name for the planet was Lul Zazkan. Lul Zazkan. LOL, Zazkan. The luminous big flower of the sky. See W. Lamb Star Lore in the Yucatec Maya Dictionaries. Archaeoastronomy in Pre Columbian America. 70. That the dark dot usually depicts the planet Mars will be demonstrated in a subsequent essay. For the logic behind this statement, see Dave Talbot, Mother Goddess, and Warrior Hero, Eon, 1988. The Death of Hercules, Eon, 1991. I would like to read that. That sounds interesting. So I'm taking it Hercules must be Mars. Jeremiah's and Widener both held that phases of Venus must have been visible in order to account for references to the horns of Venus in ancient Babylonian astronomical texts. When Venus was a comet, Kronos, winter 1987. In Australia, for example, Venus was known as Mimaguna. Mimanguna. Mimanguna. Big Eye. Polynesian Islanders referred to Venus as... Tamata Nui. Tamata Nui. Great Eye. The Maya likewise compared Venus to an eye. Naming the planet... Nahikik. Nahikik. Great Eye. See Dave Talbot, The Mythical History of the Comet Venus, Eon, 1991. I'm going to try to find some of these. There's a lot of good stuff in here. Talbot and Cochran. When was Venus a comet? Kronos, Winter, 1987. Mythology in Ancient Egypt. Mythologies of the Ancient World, New York, 1961. explosion of human imagination occurred, an outpouring of mythology and symbolism that defined cultures for thousands of years. Long after the celestial provocation itself was forgotten. early historical times, there are no records of the present planets, no diaries recording planetary motions or periods. Planets as we know them today did not exist. These were the gods, awe-inspiring, and at times capricious and terrifying. star worshippers speak of a great light of heaven motionless in the sky, the Egyptian Atum or Atum Ra, the Sumerian An, the Babylonian Anu. And enigmatically, early astronomers knew the overarching figure as the planet Saturn, whose story will be a centerpiece of our third episode. In the beginning, the gathered powers were not seen as separate gods, but as the primeval unity of heaven, the perfect conjunction, or great conjunction of the golden age. A massive sphere hung in the sky, 
and in its center stood a radiant star surrounded by explosive streamers. Cultures the world over came to see this star in feminine terms as the mother goddess, the planet Venus. Remembered as the great star, the mother of all stars. This was the central eye, heart, and soul of the primeval sun. His animating life, power, and glory, and much more. the world. This was the terrible goddess, raging in the sky with wildly disordered hair or multiple flailing arms, a celestial spectacle radiating a paralyzing light. When instability and displacement occurred, the streamers discharging from Venus grew chaotic, giving the planet a frightful countenance. The angry goddess was a comet the mythic prototype of comets. Emmanuel Velikovsky's great comet, the planet Venus. Seen in front of this central star was a smaller, darker, reddish sphere. This was the mythic warrior, the masculine heart of the heart, the child in the womb, the child on the lap, the pupil of the eye, the axle of the cosmic wheel, the most active figure of world mythology. Sky worshippers everywhere knew the identity of this warrior, the victor over dragons and chaos monsters. This global identity of Mars as the greatest of warriors shouts to us an unrecognized history. On the great sphere of heaven, a bright crescent appeared, with the orb or star of Venus between its horns. Things never seen in our sky were once revered around the world. The configuration evolved through numerous phases, The number of streamers changed repeatedly, as did their observed form. Every change in relative position produced dramatic change. The Australian physicist Wallace Thornhill flew to Portland for a 30-day visit. He convinced me that the forms I'd reconstructed were electrical. They were plasma discharge streamers stretching form will change with the intensity of the discharge. The whirling forms I'd reconstructed in the common symmetry, which I'd often laughed about, did indeed have a physical explanation. The god responsible for the deluge is made clear by several authors already cited. That Saturn, the planet, 
was deemed responsible for the flood is equally plain, especially Velikovsky, 1978 and 1979. Velikovsky appears to have been the first to claim that Saturn became a nova, an idea that he found buried in Jewish rabbinical commentaries on the deluge. That will do it for this show. Thank you so much for watching. Please like, share, comment. Until next time, take care. And I'll see you on down the road. 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 The History of Electricity and Life by Arthur Fistenberg Introduction About the author Arthur Fistenberg is a scientist and journalist who is at the forefront of a global movement to tear down the taboo surrounding this subject. Now, after graduating Phi Beta Kappa, from Cornell University with a degree in mathematics. He attended the University of California, Irvine School of Medicine from 1978 to 1982. Injury by x-ray overdose cut short his medical career. For the past 37 years, he has been a researcher, consultant, and lecturer on the health and environmental effects of electromagnetic radiation, as well as a practitioner of several healing arts about the book. 
This remarkably well-documented and referenced book is a cornerstone in the sense that it traces the deployment of electricity in our civilization. In terms of its interaction and living organisms, from its initial discovery in the 1740s all the way to our time, and even projected into the future. It should be noted that the title refers to the entire electromagnetic spectrum comprising the colors of the rainbow, including the invisible frequencies such as radio frequencies and the fields generated around conducting wires. From the very beginning, captured in a bottle, 1746 saw the first discoveries involving electricity in Europe. Leyden's experiment consisted of revealing the electric fluid by means of rubbing the hand on a glass globe spun rapidly on its axis. The static electricity thus produced made a great impression in the schools, fairs, and on private persons who had the financial means to acquire this device, with some producing electrical arcs and others brief electric shocks. The phenomenon was so popular that it was not socially acceptable to suggest that electricity could be dangerous, even though the shocks caused headaches, nosebleeds, and fatigue in certain experimenters and in the animals used in the test. Society was taken over by electromania and the most fervent exponents of being electroshocked in good company between two glasses of champagne began to receive harmful symptoms. In spite of this, the medical establishment equipped themselves with the laden flask, the forerunner of the condenser, for the purpose of carrying out medical experiments for abortions or other applications. Lovely. In this way, a completely new field of knowledge emerged concerning the biological effects of electricity on people, plants, and animals. Knowledge that was then much more extensive than that of our contemporary physicians, who daily see patients suffering from the effects of electricity without recognizing them for what they are, and who are generally ignorant of the very existence of this knowledge. 2. The deaf to hear and the lame to walk. Noting rarely positive and far more often negative effects of the application of electrical voltage on living organisms, the researchers and physicians concluded that living organisms function in a conjunction with electricity. Certain cures were brought about using electricity. As for example, in 1851, when the neurologist Duchenne treated deafness in dozens of patients by means of locally applied electrical impulses, experiments were carried out, notably by Volta in Italy, Volta, as well as other researchers in the Western world, which found evidence that the nervous, cardiac, cardiovascular, gustatory, sedatory, and other symptoms could be stimulated using the electricity produced by galvanic couples. It was found that the number of curative effects were significantly fewer than the harmful effects that were listed, which include the symptoms of electrosensitivity, ES, known today, such as headaches, dizziness, nausea, mental confusion, fatigue, depression, insomnia, etc. Electrical sensitivity. French botanist Thomas Francis Galabard, who carried out electrical experiments on living organisms, confided in a letter to Benjamin Franklin, dated 1762, that he was unable to continue his work, as his own organism had developed an intolerance to electricity. He was one of the first people to be officially declared electrohypersensitive, EHS. Reading that account, it is clear that this botanist must have been severely affected. Other professors and researchers had the same unfortunate experience and were thus forced to stop their work. Even the famous Benjamin Franklin was affected by a neurological illness. 
during his researches on electricity from 1753 onwards, and the symptoms are largely reminiscent of electro hypersensitivity. Come to think of it, maybe that was what was wrong with Tesla. Too much electricity. So much so that, at the end of the 18th century, it was generally acknowledged that electricity, among them, Christopher Columbus, Dante, Charles Darwin, Benjamin Franklin, Goethe, Victor, Hugo, and Leonardo da Vinci, Martin Luther, Michelangelo, Mozart, Napoleon, Rousseau, and Voltaire. The road not taken. During the 1790s, science was faced with an identity crisis regarding the interpretation of the unification of the four different fluids, electricity, light, magnetism, and heat. Where electricity was concerned, on the one hand, there was Luigi Galvani, who regarded electricity as an integral part of the living organism, and on the other, Volta's theory, that electricity was only a secondary effect of internal chemical reactions in the living organism. Volta, the inventor of the extremely useful electric battery, which had the potential to become a great money spinner, succeeded in winning the argument against the more global view of the interaction between electricity and the living organism. Chronic Electrical Illness From the end of the 19th century onwards, urban landscapes were transformed by the installation of telegraph lines throughout the industrialized countries. This technology uses voltages of the order of 80 volts on a single conductor with the return current being earthed. That period saw the emergence of the first stray currents to which living beings were exposed. It was then that one saw the appearance of diseases of civilization, such as neurasthemia, which afflicted Frank Lloyd Wright and Theodore Roosevelt, among other well-known figures. It should be noted in passing that neurasthemia is nearly similar to electrohypersensitivity, which is the more modern term for the same sensitivity to electricity. Around half of the telegraphists who were employed to manipulate the electrical current sent through the lines and were thus exposed to very strong electromagnetic fields were afflicted by telegraphic sickness. Once again, the symptoms were the same as those of EHS. Later on, in around 1915, it was the telephone operators who were experiencing the same symptom, for they were exposed to the electromagnetic fields from the communications for hours on end at their desks. In 1989, it was noted that in Winnipeg, 47% of the telephone operators were suffering from the same symptoms. However, in 1894, the noted Viennese psychiatrist Sigmund Freud wrote an article whose effect was disastrous. For all the unfortunates who suffered from telegraphic sickness, neurasthenia, microwave syndrome, or EHS, rather than seeing the external cause, which was electromagnetic pollution, he attributed the symptoms to disordered thoughts or poorly controlled emotions. As a result, today millions of citizens afflicted by electronic smog are being medicated instead of reducing their exposure to this pollutant. Sigmund Freud renamed neurasthenia, which was known to be caused by electricity, as a neurosis, anxiety, an anxiety attack or panic attack. This opened the way for the reckless deployment of electrification to continue unimpeded. It should be noted that in Russia, neurasthenia is listed as an environmental illness, as Freud's damaging redefinition was rejected there. 6. The Behavior of Plants 
Sir Jagadish Chander Bose and other researchers conducted numerous electrical experiments on plants and other living organisms, whose results showed definite effects. He discovered that the nerves of the plants or animals display variable behavior and that their resistivity can vary considerably, depending on the application of the current and its polarity. He also noted that the intensity of current necessary to modify the conductivity of the nerves is infinitesimal in terms of the voltage applied, something in the order of 0.3 microamperes, or 0.3. That current is significantly less than the current that is induced through a telephone conversation using a cell phone. Bose likewise discovered that the threshold of a current's bioactivity is one femtoamper, as this researcher was also familiar with radio frequency transmissions. He carried out an experiment in which a plant was exposed to a radio signal of 30 megahertz at a distance of about 218 yards, 200 meters, and found that the plant's growth was retarded during the emission period. He likewise showed that the circulation of sap in the plant slowed down when it was irradiated by the same radio signal. 7. Acute electrical illness. During the 1880s, London was supplied with direct current, but certain physicists had discovered that the distribution of alternating current generated fewer ohmic losses in the wires. There followed a battle of currents. Even though many scientists, including Edison, strongly criticized the more dangerous effects of alternating current. Ironically, it's precisely because alternating current is more harmful that it is used in the electric chair. And as everyone knows, the electrical current of the power grid is alternating. In 1889, full-scale electrification was carried out in the USA, shortly thereafter in Europe, the same year, as if by chance, doctors were inundated with cases of flu, which had until then appeared only infrequently. The victim's symptoms were far more neurological in nature, resembling neuroasthenia, and did not include respiratory disorders. The pandemic lasted for four years and killed at least a million, a million people. In 2001, Canadian astronomer Ken Tapping showed that the influenza pandemics over the previous three centuries correlated with peaks in solar magnetic activity on an 11-year cycle. It has also been found that some outbreaks of influenza spread over enormous areas in just a few days, a fact that is difficult to explain by contagion from one person to another. Also, numerous experiments seeking to prove direct contagion through close contact droplets of mucus, sounds familiar, or other processes have proved fruitless. From 1933 to the present day, virologists have been unable to present any experimental study proving that influenza spreads through normal contact between people. All attempts to do so have met with failure. Mystery on the Isle of Wight In 1904, bees began to die on the Isle of Wight, following the installation of radio transmitters by Marconi. These transmitters work at frequencies close to megahertz levels. On the other side of the channel, Jacques Arsene d'Arsenavo, I'm sorry if I butchered that, showed that sharp and hooked electromagnetic signals are far more toxic than sinusoidal signals. The truth was that after a year and a half of experimenting with radio transmitters in full health at the age of 22, Marconi began to develop fevers. These attacks continued for the rest of his life. In 1904, while working on setting up a transmitter, powerful enough for the transatlantic communications, 
His fevers became so intense that they were thought to be malaria. In 1905, he married Beatrice O'Brien, and after their honeymoon, they settled on the island close to a transmitter. As soon as Beatrice had settled in, she began to complain of tinnitus. After three months, she fell ill with severe jaundice. She had to return to London to give birth to a baby who only lived a few weeks and died of unknown causes. During the same period, Marconi spent several months suffering from fever and delirium. Between 1918 and 1921, he suffered suicidal depression while working shortwave transmitter. 1927, while on his honeymoon from his second marriage, he collapsed with chest pain and was diagnosed with serious cardiac disorders. Between 1934 and 1937, while he was developing microwave technology, he had nine heart attacks, the final one killing him at the age of 63. <coughs> On the same island, at Osborne House, Queen Victoria suffered cerebral hemorrhages and died on the evening of January 22, 1901. Just as Marconi was putting a new transmitter into operation less than 13 miles away. In 1901, there were only two transmitters. Well, in 1904, there were four, making this island the most irritated place on the planet leaving bees no room for survival. In 1906, a survey revealed that 90% of the bees had completely disappeared for no apparent reason. The colonies were brought to the island. New colonies were brought to the island, but these likewise died within a week. This epidemic spread across England, and then across the Western world, and then gradually stabilized until the armies equipped themselves with various high-powered radio transmitters towards the end of the First World War, triggering, as we have seen, the Spanish flu pandemic in 1918, which actually began in the United States at the Naval Radio School of Cambridge, Massachusetts, with 400 initial cases. The epidemic rapidly spread, to 1,127 soldiers at Funston Camp, Kansas, where wireless connections had been installed. What intrigued the doctors was that while 15% of the civilian population were suffering from nosebleeds, 40% of the Navy suffered from them. Other bleeding also occurred, and a third of those who died did so due to internal hemorrhaging of the lungs and brain. It's terrible. Man, it's just an awful way to go. And a third, the composition of the blood that had been altered as the measured coagulation time was more than twice as long as normal. These symptoms are incompatible with the effects of the influenza respiratory viruses but totally consistent with the devastating effects of electricity. Another incongruity was that two-thirds of the victims were healthy young people. A further atypical flu symptom was that the pulse slowed to rates between 36 and 48, whereas this is a common result of exposure to electromagnetic fields. In addition, it was possible to successfully treat some sufferers with massive doses of calcium. The military physician, Dr. George A. Soper, testified that the virus was spreading faster than the speed of movement of people. Various experiments were conducted attempting to infect subjects either by direct close contact or by inoculation with mucus or blood, but experimenters were unable to demonstrate any infection by this means. Each new influenza pandemic corresponds to a new advance in electrical technology. 
such as the Asian flu of 1957-58, following the installation of a powerful radar surveillance system, the outbreak of the Hong Kong flu from early 1968 onwards, following the commissioning of 28 military satellites for space surveillance at the altitude of the Van Allen belts, which protect us from cosmic radiation. 9. Earth's Electric Envelope With a core consisting mainly of iron, the rotating Earth is primarily protected by the ionosphere, then the plasmasphere, delimited by the Van Allen radiation belts at an altitude of between 1,000 and 55,000 kilometers. That's quite a ways. And by its tail, the magnetosphere, which is exposed to solar winds originating from our sun and constitutes a kind of dynamo, a complex electrical system. The exchanges of electricity between the Earth's crust and the atmosphere and even the ionosphere are permanent and constant. They are in a delicate balance. Hey, yes, and harp just pushing them things out there. Crazy and a kind of electrical respiration of the entire system has allowed life to develop on our planet, which is charged with negative ions, balanced by the positively charged ionosphere. An average vertical electrical field of the order of 130 volts per meter can be observed, with values that can, for example, rise to 4,000 volts per meter during storms. In 1953, one of the primary parameters of this electrical oscillation of our environment was discovered in the form of Winfried Schumann's frequencies, which respire at 7.83 hertz with harmonics at 14, 20, 26, and 32 hertz, called very low frequencies, VLF. It is no wonder that the organisms living in this environment are imbued with these physical values, and that, for example, our brain rhythms lie within these frequency ranges, such as the alpha rhythm, which lies between 8 and 13 hertz, while we perceive the visible frequencies ranging from blue to red of the electromagnetic spectrum. Some animals are able to see other electromagnetic frequencies, such as bees, which can see ultraviolet frequencies, or those salamanders or catfish, which can see the low electrical frequencies, while snakes are able to see the infrared frequencies. Laboratory experiments on hamsters, for example, showed that reducing the temperature and shortening the duration of daylight was not enough to put them into hibernation. Similarly, hamsters raised in Faraday cages refused to hibernate, even though the light and temperature parameters correspond to those of winter, until the Faraday protection was removed. Other experiments were conducted, such as that carried out at the Max Planck Institute in 1967 by the physiologist Rutger Weaver using two buried rooms without windows or outside contact, one shielded from natural electromagnetic fields, the other one not. It was shown that in the shielded chamber, the circadian rhythms of the volunteers became desynchronized and could vary between 12 and 65 hours, accompanied by metabolic disorders while the subjects in the chamber immersed in the Earth's fields kept a coherent rhythm of about 24 hours, and their metabolism continued to function more normally. It has been scientifically demonstrated that a living organism needs to be bathed in the electromagnetic system of our natural environment in order to function well. Moreover, acupuncture the ancient method used in traditional Chinese medicine works by using our own electrical properties and modifying the energy flow of the meridians. It has been known for some time since the 1950s that these meridians actually correspond to electrical circuits and that the Chinese Qi corresponds 
to the concept of electricity. These meridians serve dual functions. They not only transport information and energy internally from one organ of the body to another, but also serve as antennas for picking up the flow of environmental electromagnetic energy. In the early 1970s, the atmospheric physicists discovered that the Earth's magnetic field was significantly disturbed by human electrical activity. By injecting a signal into space and capturing its echo, it was established that the initial signal had been signal had in fact been modified by multiples of the 60 hertz power grid used in North America. However, this discovery did not prevent the HARP project from being launched to deliberately modify the electromagnetic properties of our planet. I mean, they're just so brilliant. <laughs> Similarly, the Van Allen belts that protect us from cosmic rays have already been altered by our electrical activity. And it may be that these double belts were originally only a single belt, which, under the influence of human emission of electric charges into space, has been depleted at its center. Hmm. Interesting. I'm just thinking about something that Michael Tessarion once said. Satellite observations show that the radiation emitted by high-voltage lines often has the effect of suppressing the natural radiation of lightning. In light of this fact, it is logical to conclude that the influenza pandemics of recent decades are linked to human electrical activity. Porphyrins and the Basis of Life Number 10. Any transformation of energy in the biological domain involves porphyrins, pigments made up of four pyrrole molecules. The fact that our nerves are able to function properly is thanks in part to porphyrins, which play a role in our cell processes. These are special molecules that function as the interface between oxygen and life. These molecules are highly reactive and interact with toxic metals or synthetic elements derived from oil and with electromagnetic fields, which in excess cause porphyria, which is more an environmental sensitivity than a disease. Dr. William E. Morton's research showed that 90% of people with multiple chemical sensitivity, MCS, are deficient in one form of porphyrin enzyme or another, as are electrohypersensitive individuals which means that the two forms of sensitivity are only different manifestations, with one and the same cause. Porphyria, which was discovered in 1891, afflicts about 10% of today's population, and first appeared at the same time as the general electrification of the Western world, from 1889 onwards. Porphyrins are central to the effects of electric smog because they not only cause EHS, MCS, or porphyria, but also cardiovascular diseases, cancer, and diabetes, as they are involved in a multiple of energetic biological processes. In the 1960s, the biologists Alan Frey and Lod Zimmer's Sedlick showed that our organisms definitely have a bioelectric component and that some of our cells sometimes behave like conductors or capacitors or semiconductors, transistors, like the components that we find in our electric devices. This is the case with myelin, the sheath that covers our nerves, which contains porphyrin bonded to zinc. Should environmental poisons, such as chemical products or toxic metals, affect this equilibrium? The myelin sheath will be damaged, which alters the excitability of the nerves it surrounds. The entire nervous system then becomes hyper-responsive to stimuli of all kinds, 
such as electromagnetic fields, the system enters a state of divergent instability, the effect becoming the cause. Contrary to the view that mitochondria are the elements of our cells that produce energy, the concept of the, the myelin sheath as being one giant mitochondrion is beginning to gain credence. The connection between porphyria and zinc was discovered in the 1950s by Henry Peters at Wisconsin Medical School. Patients suffering from porphyria and neurological symptoms were excreting a great deal of zinc in their urine, which led him to the idea that zinc chelatin might improve their condition. He did indeed see an improvement. Despite the widespread benefit belief that zinc deficiency is related to those specific disorders, similarly certain experiments have shown that zinc chelatin improves Alzheimer's disease. An Australian medical team demonstrated in autopsies that the brains of patients with Alzheimer's disease contain twice as much zinc as those of healthy patients. Size compared to the Sun and Jupiter Sorry, but I didn't have a part two coming up. I'll get it. The smallest ever We're detected. We're going to do a little chatting after this. Called OGLE TR 122B. It has a ring to it. It is observed to cross in front of a sun-like companion about once every seven days. The description of Ogle TR 122B is enigmatic, though it is only 16% larger than the gas giant Jupiter. Astronomers say that it is 96 times as massive. Astronomers describe the smallest star as a core-burning star, like our sun. But prevailing theory never anticipated such a diminutive star. Since the standard fusion model of stars required a minimum gravitating mass considerably greater than that of Jupiter, to account for the highly anomalous object, and in particular the induced wobble in the motion of its larger companion, astronomers simply accepted what their model implied. While Ogle TR-122b is only 16% larger than Jupiter, it must contain 96 times the mass of Jupiter and 50 times the density of the Sun. Investigative team member astronomer Claudio Mello of the European Southern Observatory in Santiago, Chile, summarizes the achievement of the small star this way. Imagine that you add 95 times its own mass to Jupiter, and nevertheless end up with a star that is only slightly larger. The object just shrinks to make room for the additional matter, becoming more and more dense. But this hypothesized feat of shrinking or supercondensing matter is merely hypothetical. Nothing of the sort has ever been achieved in laboratory experiments and no one has ever observed such a thing anywhere in the natural world. Were the feat not required to save a theory, astronomers would have surely called it a violation of the self-evident laws of physics. Another viewpoint is now well established. You know, they're like, ah, it's too hard to change the paradigm. Besides, the textbook lobby in Washington is one of the nation's most powerful. However, in this view, the calculations of the mass of this dwarf star are highly inflated. They do not take into account the strong electromagnetic forces between the small star and its larger parent star, nor does it factor in our profound ignorance of the nature of mass and gravity and its relationship to the electrical structure of matter. In the electric universe model, gravitational distortion of atoms within a star gives rise to atomic electric dipoles that align to form a radial internal electric field. The electric field produces charge separation within a star on a scale that not only prevents further compression but also causes splitting or perturbation, perturbation of a star in a nova outburst 
if it becomes electrically or gravitationally destabilized. The standard stellar model, however, re relies on the interior of stars obeying the perfect gas laws, which allows astrophysics to dismiss internal charge separation, as Eddington did in his seminal work, The Internal Constitution of the Stars. The result of electrical splitting is two energetic bodies of unequal size, a sun-like star and a smaller close orbiting binary partner. As we see in this example, the electric birth of the companion star or gas giant will place it much closer to its parent than traditional gravity-based models had ever envisioned or even considered possible. OGLE TR-122b is not a super-dense companion, but it is merely a subject to stronger electromagnetic interaction with its parent star but it is merely subject to stronger electromagnetic interaction within its parent star due to the nature of its birth. Where the electric force is active in this way, Newtonian calculations of mass and density will always produce bizarre results. Electrically, the standard threshold mass for a star in a meaningless concept, electrically, the standard threshold mass for a star is a meaningless concept. Stars do not have to ignite a fusion reaction in their core to produce their energy. They receive electrical power directly from the cosmic Birkeland currents that thread the galaxy, and the nuclear reactions occur, not in the core, but at the bright photosphere of a star. This is a testable claim if astronomers will ask the question. Unfortunately, when orthodox theorists confront the failure of Newtonian concepts, they often turn first to panaceas, Part panacea, proposing mere abstractions such as dark matter or supercondensed degenerate matter to save the theory. To the cosmic electricians, these computer games have no relationship to the verifiable dynamics of the natural world. It's dated March 8, 2005, from Thunderbolts. A mainstream scientist and author has come clean and admits Saturn was once a star. Is it though Mundan? Gas giant vindication and why Dr. Eugene Lee killed all. I wanted to do part two, you know. So you were saying something uh, on Discord about uh, some volcano that's causing us to have weird weather. Is that is that true? Well, there's a lot of information around that that one that went off in the Pacific. What would it be 18 months ago now? But approximately increased the atmosphere by about 10 percent with some um, moisture. Mm -hmm. Right. So you've got all that extra moisture up there, and the ch trade winds changed a bit a bit with it mm -hmm. and so through that there you get some real weird rain events but well, we've had them out here it's really yeah we've had it's weird like yeah, the, day be the day before yesterday it was like balmy almost it was like 48 you know for january that's warm and uh yeah then all of a sudden Yesterday, today, it was eight degrees. It went from being like balmy to eight degrees. That's Michigan. You know, if you don't like the weather in Michigan, stick around. Yep. Fifteen minutes, it'll change. Yes. <laughs> um, well, it's been similar out here. So our summer's been been um, fairly like we're in eastern Australia. So usually it's um, around in your world. Temperature 100, 110 degrees, where, where at maximum we've been getting to about 90, been getting a lot of thunderstorms, a lot of humidity. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so a lot of days, lots of days would be about around 75, 80 in Newell, which is around 24, 25 degrees Celsius. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I think uh, I found perks. Who knows, who, Greg? Yeah. I think I found What were you per- looking for? Um, part um, two of the Invisible what Rainbow. Was it? Part two of the Invisible Rainbow. I found part one in a previous live stream from three years ago. So I'm going to... I think it would be right about here where part two would begin. Invisible right. Rainbow. Yeah. yeah. So what we're going to do is, I'm going to finish this out, and then we're going to start another video on the little JFK chat we had, I think. I didn't get the video oh, finished, yeah. though. Yeah. So I'm still yeah. thinking about that. Oh, well, you can always, yeah. Let's yeah. see here. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. We're going to just listen to the rest of uh, Visible Rainbow Part 2. It's going to go right into Part 2, I hope. Shilatin improves okay. Alzheimer's okay. disease. Okay. Okay. An Australian Senior medical third. team demonstrated in autopsies that the brains right. of patients with Alzheimer's disease contain twice as much zinc as those of her. In 1980, cardiac arrest in young athletes was rare, with only nine cases a year. From then on, cases steadily increased by 10% per year until 1996 when the rate suddenly doubled to 64 cases, rising to 66 in the following year and 76 in the last year of the study. The American medical community could find no explanation for this, while in Europe in 2002, German environmental physicians launched an appeal calling for a moratorium on antennas and cell towers as the waves they were emitting were causing cardiovascular disorders. That was the Freiburg appeal. Dr. Samuel Milham, an epidemiologist at the Washington State Department of Health, showed through his work that cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and cancer are largely, if not entirely, caused by electricity. Paradoxically, Studies of cholesterol dating from the early 20th century did not show that cholesterol levels correlated with a higher risk of heart disease, contrary to what commonly is regarded as fact nowadays. A lot of that going around. A study of animals at the Philadelphia Zoo showed that from 1916 to 1964, cholesterol levels in mammals and birds increased by a factor between 10 and 20 even though their diet had remained completely unchanged. The only parameter that had been dramatically changed was the increase in radio frequencies. During the Second World War, a number of soldiers complained of symptoms similar to those of neurasthenia. It was initially believed in accordance with Freud's doctrine that these soldiers were suffering from anxiety problems. However, a study of 144 cases was then conducted by Dr. Mandel Cohen. This study revealed that the soldiers were, in fact, physiologically less resistant and suffered from irritable heart. They had difficulty in assimilating oxygen and had to breathe twice as fast as their comrades in better health in order to get enough oxygen. It emerged that their mitochondria were not functioning efficiently. In the end, the study showed that these soldiers were hypersensitive in a general sense, but particularly to electricity. From the 1950s onwards, scientists in the Soviet Union also observed that radio frequencies altered the electrocardiograms of individuals exposed to them as they modified mitochondrial efficiency graphs showing the statistics for death rates from heart disease broken down by the degree of electrification of the American states in 1931 and 1940 are also very explicit to leave no doubt as to the toxicity of electromagnetic fields for the heart, thus exonerating cholesterol and diets deemed too high in fat. The 
transformation of diabetes. Thomas Edison, who was involved in discoveries relating to electrical technology and was therefore exposed to electromagnetic fields to a far greater extent than his fellow citizens of the time, was diagnosed with diabetes, a disease that was very rare in 1889. Another researcher, Alexander Graham Bell, who worked in the field of telegraphy, telephony, telephony, and invented the telephone, was known to constantly complain of the symptoms of neurasthenia, known as EHS today. In 1915, he too was diagnosed with diabetes. In 1876, the book Disease of Modern Life by Ward Richardson described diabetes as a rare modern disease caused by mental exhaustion due to overwork or by a shock to the nervous system. The excessive intake of toxic addictive sugar in our modern diet naturally provides a convenient explanation of why diabetes, including pre-diabetes, affects more than half of all Americans today. However, this explanation is too simplistic. Even Dr. Evan Joslin showed that between 1900 and 1917, sugar intake had increased by 17%, while mortality from diabetes had doubled. Later, in 1987, a study of Native Americans showed radically different rates of death from diabetes, depending on territory, ranging from 7 per thousand in the Northwest to 380 per thousand in Arizona. During those years, neither lifestyle nor diet could explain such a divergence. One environmental factor, however, can indeed explain such a difference. The electrification of Native American reservations proceeded at different paces, and those in the Northwest were only electrified much later. By contrast, the Arizona reservation lies in the immediate vicinity of Phoenix. Moreover, this Native American community had its own power plant and its own telecommunication system. Another example is the population of Brazil, a major sugar producer for centuries, where diabetes was still unknown in 1870, after it had already emerged as a disease of civilization in North America. Even today, Brazilians consume 70 kilograms of refined sugar per year and per person, more than North Americans, and yet they still have two and a half times fewer cases of diabetes than the USA. In Butan, diabetes was virtually non-existent until 2002, after which the electrification of the country began in 2004. 634 new cases of diabetes were announced in 2005, 944 in 2006, and 1,470 in 2007, 2,540 with 15 deaths in 2012. There were 91 deaths, and diabetes was the eighth leading cause of death in the country, even though people's diet had not changed. As we saw in the previous chapter, Electronic smog acting on mitochondria prevents the efficient use of absorbed sugar, i.e. the combustion of sugar. The sugar, which cannot be converted into mechanical energy, is stored as fat by the body. Statistical graphs for diabetes death rates broken down by the degree of electrification of the American states in 1931 and 1940 are also very explicit, so you have no doubt as to the role played by electromagnetic fields in the appearance of large-scale diabetes, thus exonerating sugar consumption to some extent. In 1997, there was 31% increase in the number of cases of diabetes in the United States in a single year which precisely correlated with the mass introduction of cell phones in the country. Cancer and the starvation of life. In February 2011, 
the Supreme Court of Italy accused Cardinal Roberto Tucci, the outgoing president of Vatican Radio, of having created a public nuisance by polluting the environment with radio frequencies through negligence. In fact, in the period from 1997 to 2003, the children living within a 12-kilometer radius of the radio antennas had an eight times higher rate of leukemia, lymphomas, myelomas, than those who live further away. The same held true for adults, with a rate seven times higher. The German doctor and professor Otto Heinrich Warburg, winner of the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1931, showed that cancer is a regression oxygen-deprived cells, which drives them to multiply anarchically, as in a primeval world where oxygen was not present to the extent that it is today. The initial oxygen deprivation is due to a malfunction of the mitochondria, which, as we have seen, can be caused by electromagnetic fields or other pollutants, such as smoke, pesticides, food additives, and air pollution. The same principle of cellular oxygen deficiency applies to diabetes, which is why there is a higher rate of cancers among diabetics than the rest of the population. At Philadelphia Zoo from 1901 to 1955, a rise in the rate of malignant tumors was noted in mammals, varying from twice to 22 times more between those dates. Cancer death statistics show a clear correlation between the electrification of countries and cancer rates. For example, in the USA, the rate was 6.6 .6 per thousand from 1841 to 1850. It subsequently more than doubled from 1851 to 1860, with a rate of 14 per thousand. The true explanation for this can be found in the mass deployment of the telegraph in 1854. In 1914, there were two deaths from cancer among the 63,000 Native Americans living in reserves without electrification, while in the rest of the country the cancer mortality rate was 25 times higher. Between 1920 and 1921, following the introduction of the first AM radio stations, cancer mortality increased by between 3 and 10 percent in some Western countries. The Swedish researchers Ole Johansson and Orjan Hallberg have shown a clear correlation between breast, prostate, and lung cancer rates and the exposure of the population to radio frequencies. They point to a significant increase in rates in 1920, 1955, 1969, and a decrease in 1978, corresponding respectively to the increase in radio frequency smog due to the introduction of AM radio, FM radio, and TV1. The arrival of color TV2 and then the cessation of AM radio broadcasts. These same researchers have likewise found a very clear linear correlation between the number of FM radio transmitters per region and the incidence of melanomas, with the exposed locations having 11 times more melanomas than the white zones. They also found that melanomas rarely appear on those areas of the body most exposed to the sun, such as the forehead, nose, shoulders, and feet but more often in those areas of the body usually protected from the sun. Moreover, the proliferation of skin cancers occurred before the coming into fashion of seaside holidays, during which sun exposure is intense. This shows that melanomas are not predominantly caused by the sun, but by radio frequencies. The statistical graphs of death rates from cancer, as well as from diabetes and cardiovascular disease, broken down by the degree of electrification of American states in 1931 and 1940, are likewise very explicit 
leaving no doubt whatever that electromagnetic fields play a role in the increase in cancers. Genuine data on brain tumors is hard to find, as the cell phone lobby has been infiltrating this field for decades. In order to commission biased studies, one of their studies even shows a decrease in the incidence of tumors correlating with the intensive use of cell phones. However, the University of Calgary has found evidence of a 30% increase in the incident of malignant brain tumors in the period from 2012 to 2013. And Leonard Hartle, professor of oncology at the University Hospital in Orbo, Sweden, has demonstrated that 2,000 hours of cell phone use increases the risk of developing a tumor by a factor of between 3 and 8, depending on the age of the subject and their phone habits. In 2000, Neil Cherry analyzed the cancer rates of children in San Francisco in relation to the distance between their home and the television and FM radio stations and radio transmitters on Sutro Tower. Children living on hills or ridges were more affected. Those who lived within one kilometer of the antenna had a nine times higher, had a nine times higher incidence of leukemia, a 15 times higher incidence of lymphoma, and a 31 times higher incidence of brain cancer. Lovely. Overall, an 18 times higher rate than those living outside that one kilometer radius. A practical treatise on nervous exhaustion in 1880 by George Miller Beard, the electrotherapist and friend of Thomas Edison, contains an intriguing observation. Although these difficulties are not directly fatal, and so do not appear in the mortality tables, although, on the contrary, they may tend to prolong life and to protect the system against febrile and inflammatory disease. Yet, the degree of suffering they cause is enormous. Those who suffered the most seemed rather young for their age. Furthermore, Beard noted that one rare disease seemed more likely to afflict the neuroesthetic subjects than the rest of the population. That disease was diabetes. Beard had already observed that the increase in life expectancy did not go hand in hand with life quality. The mysterious correlation between the sufferings of neuroesthetic people, whose symptoms were the same as those who of contemporary electro-hypersensitive people, and the prolongation of their lives pointed to a major dysfunction. In addition, it has long been observed that the ascetic lifestyle with a low-calorie diet can increase life expectancy and health. This is the case, for example, with the population of Okinawa, where the number of centurions is 40 times greater than those in the population of richer prefectures further to the north. Researchers in the field of aging have pointed out that the force that drives and sustains our lives is the system of electron transport in the mitochondria of our cells. It is here that the air we breathe and the food we eat are combined at a rate that determines our rate of aging, and hence our life expectancy. Whereas the achievement of a slowing down of the combustion process within ourselves through moderating the amount of energy delivered may be beneficial. Another way of slowing down may conversely be disastrous. This is the poisoning of the electron transport chain. One possible way of being poisoned is chronic exposure to artificial electromagnetic fields. This ever-increasing pollution subjects the electrons of our mitochondria to external forces, slowing them down, depriving our cells of oxygen, and causing EHS symptoms.
15. You mean you can hear electricity? In 1962, a woman contacted the University of Santa Barbara, California, USA, asking for help in finding the source of the mysterious sound that she was hearing everywhere, at home, even though she lived in a quiet residential district. This sound was keeping her awake and was detrimental to her health. Measurements did indeed show that particularly strong electromagnetic fields were emanating from all electrical conductors, not only from the grid, but also from the radiators and other metallic elements. Yet, the stethoscope itself detected no sound at all. The engineer carried out an experiment, recording the measured fields on tape and playing them to the woman affected by these noises. She confirmed that was what she was hearing. So this woman was able to hear the electromagnetic fields in her environment. Grounding facilities and electronic filters were installed to reduce disturbances to an acceptable level. However, long before that, Volta and other researchers had already conducted experiments in which they had successfully produced various sounds by applying voltage to the ears. Much later, in the 1960s, the biologist Alan Frey Alan Fry published articles on the ability of some subjects to hear emissions from a radar installation. The mechanical model, you know, that reminds me when I was a kid, I grew up about a mile and a half from Selfridge Air Force Base, and at that time they had the radar dish on, and for years they were just pelting the people in the neighborhoods with that radar uh, signal, and my dad got diabetes, come to think of it. Hmm. That's just crazy. Every time the dish would pass our house, our TV, it would go zzz. It would make this noise. And after a while, we just got deaf to it. But it did it for years. Hmm. The mechanical model of the functioning of the ear, as taught in schools, does not provide any explanation for these observed phenomena. Noting this, the biochemist Lionel Naftalin developed a new model of the functioning of the human ear, taking into account the well-known phenomenon of piezoelectricity, a force utilized by electricians, which he discovered in the gel covering the cilia of the inner ear. In this gel, which is found nowhere else in the human body and has special electrical properties, a voltage of 100 to 120 millivolts was present, which is considered high in the field of bioelectronics. This piezoelectrical gel transforms sound wave into an electrical signal that is communicated to the cilia of the inner ear. This new revised model of the functioning of the human ear not only explains the ability of certain subjects to hear an electromagnetic signal under certain conditions, but also why so modern people today suffer from tinnitus, and why certain groups of people amounting to 2 to 11 percent of the world's population are hearing a global humming all around the planet. Today, about 44 percent of American adults suffer from tinnitus at various levels of intensity, while in Sweden a number of young people affected was 12 percent in 1997, and 42 in 2006. These parasitic sounds are largely the result of living in an environment that is heavily polluted with all kinds of artificial electron volts per meter. He has also observed a marked change in the behavior of storks, whereby stork pairs will fight instead of building the nest or incubating the eggs if they are within 200 meters of a cell tower. The United Kingdom classed the house sparrow as an endangered species after its population declined by 75% between 1994 and 2002, a period that coincided with the deployment of cell phone technology. I do seem to remember back around the turn of the 21st century about giant uh, areas of birds just being dead, just dying. Homing pigeons, breeders of several continents, have found that when released, up to 90% of pigeons 
fail to find their way back to the Dovco, whereas this percentage should normally be tiny. In 2000, English breeders tried to reroute a race so as to avoid cell towers in order to give the pigeons a better chance of homing successfully. In 2004, those same breeders commissioned more extensive studies on the impact of microwaves on pigeons. In 2002, the U.S. National Park Service issued a note to biologists studying wild animal behavior, explaining that RFID chips attached to those animals to track them with radio frequencies can radically alter their behavior due to the radio frequencies generated. In environments polluted by electromagnetic fields, robins cannot find their bearings for migration, whereas when they are in a Faraday cage, they are able to do so. An experiment on frog tadpoles reared in two separate pools within 140 meters of a cell tower, one without and the other with electromagnetic shielding, displayed mortality rates of 90% and 4% respectively. The same type of harmful effects are found in insects when they are exposed to the electromagnetic smog that we encounter on a daily basis. And Dr. Pinkopoulos, who has experimented on fruit flies, reports that exposure to microwaves at common levels in just a few minutes a day for a few days is the worst known stressor in our daily lives, even worse than chemicals or low-frequency electromagnetic fields. Hmm. Bees are also being negatively impacted as we saw on the Isle of Wight at the beginning of this summary. Dr. Daniel Favre, Switzerland, has demonstrated that in the presence of microwaves, bees emit the sound typically heard when they swarm, which suggests that insects want to escape the emission source. The Varroa mite is generally blamed for colony collapse syndrome. However, we forget that this mite has cohabited with bees for a long time. In addition, it can often be observed that nowadays even a dead colony is not infested with parasites, even though this used to be the case before. The finger of blame is also leveled at pesticides. Yet, as we have seen, 90% of the bees on the Isle of Wight disappeared without any pesticides having been used in that area. One true cause of colony collapse is found in human-generated electromagnetic fields, especially cell phone technology. In the 1980s, a burning issue emerged, the death of forests. This was blamed on acid rain, yet the most remote areas with the cleanest air were equally affected. Research was carried out in Germany and Switzerland, and although the soil in the affected forest did indeed prove to be acidic. Observation and experimentation showed that such acidity could also be the result of the slow electrolysis of the soil via trees exposed to radar waves. For example, moreover, trees on ridges were more severely affected as they were more exposed to the new radars installed in the 1970s. Another observation was made at the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall. The gigantic Russian radars at Skirda, which were heavily irritating the whole region in their area in their task of monitoring the West, had not only caused harm to the forest, but also to the animals and the human beings. After numerous studies, it was found that the growth rings of the trees during the years when the radars were operating were much smaller than those from either before or after that period. In Schwarzenberg in Switzerland, a shortwave radio antenna was installed in 1939, and the transmission power was subsequently increased to 450 kilowatts in 1954. This was followed by a deterioration in the health of the local inhabitants, who complained of VHS symptoms. The village children had difficulties at school and seemed unable to advance to higher education, unlike the children of less exposed neighboring villages. Finally, in 1992, a study was carried out which confirmed 
that within a radius of 900 meters of the antenna, the physiological analysis parameters of people and animals at the site were abnormal. It was also found that the tree growth rings were compressed, but only on the side facing the radiation source. On March 28, 1998, the transmitter was shut down and a before and after study was carried out. This demonstrated that the melatonin levels of the 58 subjects tested had increased again. A 50-year-old villager was finally able to sleep for a full night without interruption for the first time in his life. On May 29, 1996, Philip Roche, director of the Office for the Environment, stated that there was a proven correlation between the sleep disorders and communication operations. Seventeen, in the country of the blind. How much longer do we have to wait before being able to say, your cell phone is killing me, rather than, I'm electrohypersensitive? And yet, the number of people suffering from headaches due to using cell phones is huge. In 2010, two-thirds of Ukrainian university students interviewed admitted the fact that it is not socially acceptable to openly discuss this issue. Gro Harlem Brundtland was EHS when she was head of the World Health Organization. She was quite open about the fact, but was forced to resign from her post one year later. This deterred over high-ranking public figures from following her example. Of course, they're cowardly and beholden to the super-rich who contribute to their campaign. It's a circus. Only a minority of people suffering from electromagnetic pollution know what they are suffering from, while the great majority have no idea. The entire population is being electrocuted by remote control, and one almost has to apologize for being electrosensitive, or to be precise, electrohypersensitive. Just as if one had to apologize for being cyanide hypertensitive, for the truth is that electricity, as it is currently being used, is toxic. Moreover, statistical graphs clearly show an increase in the mortality rate of the inhabitants of nine American cities shortly after the first base stations were put into operation. This increased mortality rates from 25 to over 80 percent. A survey conducted by a daily newspaper, which asked New Yorkers to report whether they had begun suffering from a number of EHS symptoms after November 15, 1996, gathered hundreds of testimonies from a wide range of racial and social classes. The date in question was the day when the first cell phone network went into operation. The Cellular Phone Task Force, an organization started by Arthur Fistenberg in 1996, is inundated with requests for help from people harmed by microwave radio frequencies. So many emitters of all kinds proliferate, from Wi-Fi, WiMAX, radar stations are irritated, and irritation emitted from the sky by telecommunication satellites that it seems as if soon there will be nowhere to escape to. Professor Uli Johansson of the prestigious Karolinska Institute, who is famous for awarding the Nobel Prize for Medicine, has focused on demonstrating the effects of electromagnetic smog on living organisms since 1977. The success of his studies led to his being marginalized at his institute. Hmm. The funding for his research disappearing and his receiving death threats. On one occasion, he narrowly escaped an attempt on his life through the sabotage of his motorcycle. Despite everything, he continues to inform the world the truth in order to defend, among others, those suffering from EHS, whose lives have become hell on earth. He is disgusted by the way in which the governments of so-called democratic countries can simply abandon the victims of radio frequencies to their fate. Dr. Erica Mallory Blythe, who has dual British and American nationality, completed her studies in 1998. 
In 2007, after following her F-16 pilot husband to the USA, she became severely affected by EHS without realizing it. Her internet researches finally enabled her to understand what was happening to her. As a doctor, she was puzzled as to how such profound and disabling condition could exist without ever having heard of it in her profession. To set her mind at rest, she decided to undergo an MRI to rule out the risk of brain cancer. She believed that her death was intimate when the high-frequency pulsations were engaged, but recovered to full health and vitality in Death Valley. Far from the radio frequencies, since then she has dedicated herself to informing and helping the 5%, at least, of the population who are EHS and have been totally abandoned by the authorities. Yuri Grigorov, who is generally regarded as the grandfather of electromagnetic research in Russia, is extremely concerned about young people above all. He has stated that this is the first time in the history of humanity that people's brains are being openly exposed to microwaves, which is extremely serious in the eyes of the radiologist. In particular, he cites a Korean study which shows that Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, ADHD, in children is connected to the use of cell phones. In the late 1990s, the Swedish neurosurgeon Leif Salford and his team proved that cell phones make the blood-brain barrier permeable, causing Alzheimer's disease. In 2003, they showed that a single exposure of only two hours causes permanent damage to the brain. In 2015, Turkish scientists irritated rats for an hour a day for a month using typical cell phone waves. The irritated rats had 10% fewer brain cells than those that had been spared that treatment. The same team experimented on pregnant rats for nine days at the same radiation level. The rats' progeny showed degeneration of the brain spinal cord, heart, kidneys, liver, spleen, thymus, and testicles. The same experiment, repeated on young rats, caused atrophy of the spinal cord, together with decreased myelin, like that seen in multiple sclerosis. In September 1998, the first 66 satellites for space telephony went into operation causing an increase in the USA's national mortality rate by nearly 5% in the two subsequent weeks. During the same period, it was observed that birds were no longer flying and that EHS people became particularly ill. Today, about 1,100 artificial satellites fly over the U.S., but several companies, Google, Facebook, SpaceX, OneWeb, and Samsung, planning to launch up to 4,600 new communication satellites, each by 2020, in order to blanket the entire planet with high-speed internet access. 6G is coming out now, too. In 1968, even the first small fleet of 28 military satellites precipitated a worldwide flu pandemic. Unlike a ground-based antenna, whose radiation is highly attenuated, when it reaches the magnetosphere, satellites act directly on it through mechanisms that are still poorly understood, thus compromising life on Earth. We forget the warnings of Ross Eddy, the grandfather of bioelectromagnetics, and of the atmospheric physicist Neil Cherry, that we are electrically regulated by the world surrounding us, and that the safe level of exposure to radio frequencies is therefore zero. This potentially catastrophic initiative must be opposed, and the organization leading the way is the Global Union Against Radiation Deployment from Space, or GUARDS. The website will be in the description. In 2014, the physician Tetsharu Shinjo published a before and after study. He evaluated the health of 122 inhabitants of a building on which base station antennas had been installed. 21 suffered from chronic fatigue, 14 from dizziness or 
Meniere's disease, 14 from headaches, 17 from eye pain or infections, 14 from insomnia, and 10 from chronic nosebleeds. Five months after the antennas were removed, only two cases of insomnia, one case of vertigo, and one case of headaches remained. Now there's your answer. This human rights emergency, which affects hundreds of millions of people on a planetary scale, and the environmental emergency that threatens the extinction of countless species of plants and animals, must be faced. It's still a still here. Uh, yeah. So what do you think about that, man? I, you know, I really before I saw this video and I have to thank Don, uh, a super supporter for a long time for bringing it to my attention. It's something you never really think about. You know, that all these waves are going through us. We're adding more and more. We're going. Yeah. 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 And uh, what's that guy? Muscoil, Javon Muscoil for men, he wants to have like 1,600 satellites. And who cares if you can get cell reception in the mountains? You know, it's ridiculous. But it's just, you know, par for yeah, the course. It's all ultimately about... Par for the course. It's all about reception. Yep. Yeah, I mean, everything is like that, right? My phone, I gotta find my chargers down to four percent. What? But you know but you know, Greg, if they tried taking our cell phones off us now because they said they weren't healthy, we wouldn't be so happy about giving them up. No, but you can buy these things no. you can put on them to make them less. Yeah, but are they really I don't know. I don't know. Because really the thing them. is, if you put that on that stop that to stop those waves, well, how's the phone going to work? Because it right. can't get the waves to work. You, you, have, a, you have a point. Yeah. 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 I know some people, they put it in a Faraday cage, their phone. Yeah. 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 Because everything, I mean, when you think about it, even uh, fumes from sprays, you know, that can affect you. If it's harmful yep. chemicals, you know, we don't really know. We don't really think about it. We should. Well, I, I notice there's a little more left here, so I guess I might as well finish. I don't know what's here, but let's finish it out and see where we can go from there. Okay? Yep. I agree. Okay. All right then, Rick. 
I'll see let's you. Get, let's talk, get going. Talk to you soon. Cool. Good to have talk you. Soon. All right. Giants. I want to close this one down. Start part two. And the first one is an hour long audio called The Giants of Atlantis. That'll be coming right up. We'll come out and say hello in a minute. That was old. Don't listen to it.
see how bad the lag is? It's ridiculous. We'll take a look at this. I don't even remember making it. All the links will be there within 24 hours. Look at that. It's ridiculous. I hope it's coming through okay. I don't want to find out I didn't do a show. <laughs> Come on, where are you at? What's going on? Let's get it together here, folks. There it is. A possible ancient crystal radio transmitter or receiver. Archaeologists have discovered some very strange artifacts in an ancient Angkor Temple Complex by Shishrang Basin in Cambodia. It was here that archaeologists unearthed two stone turtles, but both had one oddity. Surf, the first had a square, the second a triangular niche tightly closed on top with perfectly fitted cover. Inside of the rectangular turtle, they found a strange gel, which they took a sample of. Will the ancients ever cease to amaze us? Why was it placed in this stone vessel? Why was it buried in the temple premises? They confirm that these stone turtles are at least a thousand years old, but maybe much older. The second stone turtle, which was also buried in the mud, has a triangular lid on its body, and what the archaeologists have found inside is shocking. They found neatly polished quartz crystals. Hundreds of neatly polished quartz crystals were placed in the triangular niche in the statue. Once they were discovered, the locals began to come in large numbers. Cambodians are very spiritual people, and they performed all kinds of rituals with these artifacts and crystals. But is it just spiritual energy radiating from them? Or is there a science behind it all? I mean, why did the ancient builders carve hundreds of crystalline quartz stones, polish and cherish them. Today, we use the same material in semiconductors for transistors, integrated circuits. The first radio communication devices we used were made entirely of crystalline quartz. Is it possible the ancient builders used some kind of radio communication device? But before you decide, wait. Inside of the triangular turtle, they found a roll of bronze wire. Archaeologists are confused by this mainstream. They simply ignore it, saying that these are just threads for religious purposes. Bronze threads are never used in any Hindu or Buddhist ritual. It is unheard of. These are bronze wires, and the ancient builder used them for a different reason. Bronze is not a metal. It is an alloy made of several metals, such as copper and tin. But wait a second, there's more. Is it just a coincidence that they found crystal quartz and bronze wire side by side? Look at the crystal radios we used decades ago. They were simple devices made from wires and crystal quartz. Only the antenna is missing. And they could make a crystal radio device out of these objects and start receiving signals. But wait, this isn't the end. Archaeologists also unearthed, very close to the turtles, high quality metal rods with three prongs like a trident sticking out in the air. They could have been used as antennas for radio communications in ancient times. Who could they have talked to? Is it possible? Well, we know that today we get these FRBs, fast radio bursts, which sound like this. And mainstream cosmologists and physicists have no idea what to that. But in reality, we know what it is. It's electricity that's doing it. And cores of stars are probably made of iron. The strange object sends out a beam of radiation that crosses Earth's line of sight. And for one minute in every 20 is one of the brightest radio sources in the sky. And um, it's 4,000 light years away from Earth. So it's in our galactic backyard. There's a self-proclaimed kind of con man slash self-proclaimed psychic named Yuri Geller. Some of you might, that name might be familiar to you. 
He, he, helped. he is uh, so serious about it. I think he wrote President Biden a letter saying that this is an alien force on its way to Earth to attack. I kid you not. <laughs> but anyways, that that's another source of radio waves coming in. We also have another one where we're getting a mysterious signal from the core of the Milky Way. And uh, we also are getting a strange radio signal from Ganymede. That's pretty interesting in itself. So yeah, there are a, space is pretty busy you know, with signals. And like this one, it it, uh, it flares three times an hour. It's like clockwork too. That's why some think that they're some kind of rudimentary uh, communication device for aliens or extraterrestrial. I don't particularly subscribe to that hypothesis. It does exist though. Now I'm only a layman, as you know, and I'm no expert, but I would imagine what we're seeing is some kind of uh, passer going off or uh, maybe plasmoid. <clears throat> plasmoid. It's interesting, but uh, they're not going to ever get it because they're living in the fictitious world of dark energy and gravity. Now, if they find anything reasonably facsimilating a speaker, then it'll be a done deal. But until then, I reserve judgment. What do you say? Ancient radio? Possible? Pure coincidence. There is just one more discovery to report on in this affair, and that is this stone was unearthed with this diagram carved into it. The diagram just happens to be one of the symbols for sound, still, think it's a coincidence? Back to it. Best video. Best video. Andy, are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah, you're on this to the rig. Ah, good. Yeah, probably. Ground control to Major Tom. You there? So, what do you think, man? Yes. You think it's possible the ancients uh, had uh, radio? Well, it's quite possible that they had some main computer. Yeah, well they, yeah, for sure they had to have something, you know, like when you Up see those to, things. Well, lot like blue heat. Yeah, it's not like white hot, it's no, blue no, hot. No, no, yeah. no, no. And that's even it's hotter, that, that's no, not no. the natural yeah. color of Venus. Uh, that, that's been see, created by plasma. I'll fix that. I'll fix that. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, What's I noticed it? that What's before you now? get that leg. What's it doing now? But there's too many. Go away. I don't know what that was. Okay, so let's There's go. There's too many coincidences, Greg. Around. Too many okay, coincidences? when you look around at all the different... Yes. yes. You know, similar buildings. Absolutely. And structures. And well Similar said. thoughts in the way. And you've got to say, there's a lot of coincidence that they must have been communicating. Right. You know. Right. Um, but then we don't really know the timelines either. You know, a lot of the timelines are just really good guesses. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you're right there. Yeah, that's basically all we can do, really. All right. Mm -hmm. We're going to go through one more right. here. What? All right. Good. All right then. Anything you want about to say? lag and fixed? Yeah. Uh, it's there, but no. yeah, I'm trying to work with it. I back. All right, let's put this one on. All right then. We already went into it for a little yep. ways, and uh, man, just the only thing I don't want to do is get to the end of the playlist and then find out 
All known for gas giants in the solar system were once Planet X stellar cores. SC or H was a central SC of a Planet X SC system. The systems were comprised of the core system that was once inside a star or a planet and the debris pieces which had once constituted the body material of the object. When stars become energy depleted, the material that made up the body of the stars and that had been created by the cores broke into pieces and the cores were released from inside the body of the star. They became a jumbled mess of cores surrounded by debris field. Figure 1 here is a beautiful picture of Saturn. It's nine times larger than the Earth, and like Jupiter, it was a large central core of what was once a star. Planets will tend to be about the same size as the Earth, and thus have a core system with a central core. Now, that would be smaller than the Earth. Now, that is something that really caught my attention because I have always thought that somehow all of the cores in the solar system of the, the sun's surface with the cores of all the planets, I mean, how else would they stay hot? They have to continuously be going through this effect where it would cool down. I'm sure the Earth's rotation probably helps, too. But it has to be connected to something extraterrestrial. And when they're a safe distance away, it's not as or volatile. It doesn't take billions of years to cool down. The sun and the core of the Earth are the same temperature, which is a big indicator that they're connected via Brooklyn currents. In fact, this picture right here can, almost can be looked at like the sun's Brooklyn current to Earth. Is that what we're looking at here? Or is that just a, some kind of a mirage? Anyways, get back to it here. Figure 2, a star's core breaks into one larger core surrounded by satellite cores. Some of the satellite cores are ejected outside of the body of the star and turn into new planets. See Article 785, Planet X is here, but what is it exactly? Saturn was thus most likely one of the first Planet X stars, which came into the solar system and must have therefore been relatively close to the Sun. Since much larger cores have since come in, and since the central core must be smaller than the body of the star, Saturn must have been quite a small star, since the sun is over ten times larger than it. The central SC, I want to think that it means surface charge, but it means something else to her, of the planet X SC system, shown in figure two, seemed to be larger than the sun, and some which seem to be much larger than the sun, have been observed, which suggests that the smaller stars came in first and the larger stars have come in more recent, come in to where? Which also explains why the cataclysmic effects caused by these systems on the Earth have been increasing at a fast rate. Larger systems can draw energy at a faster rate, which will increase the gravitational effects, which lead to gravitational anomalies, cataclysmic weather, large waves at sea, as well as earthquakes and volcanic eruptions, in addition to sinkholes and fissures. Other Planet X effects on Earth, volcanic eruptions, tornadoes, tidal surges, and gigantic rogue waves. Since Saturn was once a star, it would have had planets which most likely came in with it, or right after it did. Of course it did, and Earth was one of them. You know, they're catching on, slowly or surely, they're catching on. Saturn's rings are what is left of its debris field. Yes, that's true. It is made up of matter which was part of the body, water mostly, of the star that Saturn once was. Brown dwarfs have copious amounts of water. The central cores induce plasma eruptions from the sun until the sun envelops them in a permanent plasma connection, which sustains them with energy as if they were one of the sun's created planets, after which time they go into orbit around the sun.
They never manage to get enough gravitational energy, which we would associate with a solid object of their size, which is why they end up orbiting inside the solar system much further out than would be expected for huge solid objects. Well, the bigger they are, the more surface charge they have, which means they have to be further away to be able to repel. That's, just, that's how I take that. Solid objects with only a thin layer of gaseous atmosphere. In conclusion, Saturn was once a small star and thus most likely had planets. It came into the solar system as a planet X central core and was adopted by the sun as one of its planets. How about that? A mainstream scientist is on the Saturn theory bandwagon. And I, th I believe, like Ted said, in 30 years, I think some, some sort of Saturn theory will replace the Big Bang eventually. Ah, uh, yes, the fusion assumption has never been authenticated. And one other thing that I would say is, what does she think the energy is when she says the energy? It's electricity. It's the only thing it can be. The only force in the universe. That's what they suppress. She's on the right track, but she's using the wrong model. Cores of stars are cool. That's why they're black. Unless they have some new epicycle to enter, when something is hotter, it's brighter, and the core would be brighter in, su in sunspots, not uh, well, a black hole, basically. This is the real, only real black hole that exists in the universe, a sunspot, the umbra. How can nuclear fusion be black? It can't. It's just commonsensical that if nuclear fusion was going on in the core, that it wouldn't be black. Her theory sounds an awful lot like uh, like de Grazia and Milton's Solaria Benaria. I'll link that to this for you. It was Velikovsky's claim that only a few thousand years ago, a period of chaos reigned in the solar system. One of the planets closely associated with Earth was Saturn, and watery filaments rained on our planet following Saturn's violent flare-up. Decades later, based on the respective research of Dave Talbot and Eduardo Cardona, Thornhill developed his own model of a primordially close relationship between Earth and Saturn, which was the source of all the water in our oceans, while leaving remnants in its rings. Today, Thornhill continues his presentation, shifting his focus to his own successful predictions for the Saturnian system, including the mysterious moon Titan. Before I tell the epic story, a warning. Our education systems train students to memorize a litany of facts, which produces global groupthink. Students are not given the time or encouragement to critically examine the history of ideas. A leading researcher into the learning functions of the divided brain, Dr. Ian McGilchrist, has shown such blinkered left hemisphere training renders students functionally blind to alternative ways of looking at a problem. The left hemisphere simply blocks out everything that doesn't fit with its take. It doesn't see it, actually, at all. So scientists with their narrow specialised training may look at but cannot see what to a non-expert may seem obvious. They will be the last to see a paradigm shift in the making. This is particularly evident for electrical phenomena in space. Even the Nobel Prize winning founder of the idea of an electric universe, Hans Ophain, was ignored when he warned in his 1970 acceptance speech of an inevitable crisis in astrophysics if electric circuits in space are not recognised. Houston, we still have that problem after almost 50 years. I have lived since a teenager with uncertainty about accepted truths and learned to have the courage to challenge them. The result is not chaos, but a synthesis of ideas that explains the old ideas better and finds new ways of incorporating what seems a chaos of anomalies. And the best test is that of classical physics, simplification. The resulting paradigm shift is not a threat, but an invitation to the greatest adventure we may ever know. 
to begin to understand our real place in the universe for the first time. In our electric universe, stars and planets are formed at the same time inside molecular clouds along a snaking cosmic lightning bolt. Some gas giant planets are subsequently formed in close orbits about a star that has ejected charged matter to achieve stability with a changed electrical environment. The ejection flares may account for the flickering of newborn stars, which can't be explained by gravitational accretion. This explains the unexpected hot Jupiter seen in large numbers closely orbiting other stars. The most numerous stars in the galaxy, brown dwarfs, which would appear reddish if they could be seen with the naked eye, are generally classed as failed stars, yet they have the baffling ability to produce massive stellar flares. This is simply explained because red stars don't have the ability of main sequence bright stars to control their current by a transistor-like action in their photospheric plasma. A brown dwarf can only respond by discharging matter electrically. The capture process of a brown dwarf star involves flaring and ejection of charged matter by that body in order to achieve a new electrical equilibrium in its adopted family. That accounts for the large number of close orbiting moons of our captured gas giants in remote orbits. With this in mind, I want to take you back to just before the famous Cassini-Huygens space probe was to arrive at Saturn on July the 1st, 2004. In news reports, Saturn was dubbed the original Lord of the Rings. There is a profound truth behind such a glib turn of phrase, but it wasn't until the advent of the telescope that Christian Huygens in 1656 was able to suggest that Saturn had a ring. So how do we explain the Saturnian ring symbolism that pervades our cultures? The halo of the saints, the royal crown, and the ring given in marriage are Saturnian symbols, as are the circled or Celtic cross, the Egyptian ansate cross or ankh, the eye of Ra and the astronomically baffling star inside the crescent. The star at the top of the lighted Christmas tree is pure Saturnian imagery. It is truly amazing that we are still haunted by prehistoric archetypes. It helps us to understand the extraordinary archetypal attraction of Tolkien's fantasy of Lord of the Rings. He was well versed in mythology. The following description of events is based on the surprisingly detailed and truly remarkable scholarship of Talbot and Cardona, which required explanations with the physics of an electric universe. Let's call our primordial star Proto-Saturn. It was an independent brown dwarf with its own entourage of satellites, including the Earth, Mars and Titan. Proto-Saturn's dim reddish light was due to a glowing red anode plasma sheath, much larger than the Sun, enclosing Proto-Saturn and its inner satellites in a radiant cell. The term dwarf star is purely theoretical, since they are difficult to see and measure. In fact, NASA reported a brown dwarf which was radiating as if it had twice the expected surface area. The environment inside the radiant red shell is most hospitable for life on any enclosed satellites because there are no seasons and water is conspicuous in the spectra of such stars. Water misted down on this planet continually and red light is ideal for photosynthesis, which explains the abundance of ferns and other vegetation globally in the Carboniferous era. But there is a catch. Brown dwarf stars are known to flare, sometimes to the extent, as one astronomer commented, that any satellites would suffer a very bad day. Such flaring by proto-Saturn accounts for the geological strata and the fossil record of a number of global mass extinctions and instant burial of dismembered plant and animal remains. As we approached the Sun from deep space, our plasma sheath flickered like a faulty electric light when the two stellar plasma sheaths, or magnetospheres, began to clash. Proto-Saturn's galactic electrical power was usurped by the Sun, and its appearance changed dramatically. Before dimming forever, the dwarf star Proto-Saturn would have flared brilliantly like a comet, ejecting charged matter to relieve the electrical stresses caused by the sudden change in environment. Even now the former star has not completely cooled. 
Saturn still radiates more than twice the heat it receives from the Sun. And we have a simple explanation for the origin of Saturn's mysteriously short-lived water ice rings. As the proto-Saturnian system approached the Sun in the outer solar system, our minor star's gravitational sphere of influence steadily shrank and its outer satellites were progressively stripped away. This and the earlier capture of the other gas giants provides the source of trans-Neptunian objects as they're known, including Pluto with its unexpected geology and atmosphere, and its peculiar moons. There is a simple physical characteristic that links a captured star with its offspring. It is the axial tilts. Like our close orbiting moon, satellites tend to orbit their primary with the same face always turned toward it. If they orbit in the equatorial plane, their spin axis will be aligned with that of the primary. As gyroscopes, the satellites will retain the same tilt even if jolted from their orbit, although the process may induce a wobble of the spin axis. It is therefore highly significant that the two key planets identified in the ancient pantheons, Saturn and Mars, have axial tilts closely similar to that of the Earth. The tilt of Saturn at 27 degrees to the ecliptic plane is itself an enigma, unless it formed independently from the Sun. Venus was described as a spectacular discharging body in the ancient congregation of planets. It can be explained if Venus was ejected in the flare-up of proto-Saturn and the infall of the stream of ejected matter from swiftly rotating proto-Saturn gave Venus a slow retrograde spin. The magnitude of the axial tilt of Venus to the ecliptic is much less than Saturn's, which suggests that Venus was ejected from a low latitude. This accounts for the hellish temperature and new surface of Venus, having been recently spat from the mantle of a brown dwarf star. Its filamentary equatorial scars caused by spectacular radial discharging and its thick atmosphere inherited from the brown dwarf and subsequently modified by interplanetary and cometary discharges. Venus still has a cometary magneto tail stretching to the Earth's orbit and its mountain tops glow with plasma discharges which we turn Magellan's radar signals as unexplained shininess. Past history. The solar nebula model has no successful predictions to its name. And that's a bit of a sobering thought. My meeting uh, with Dr. Velikovsky, I visited him in 1979 at his home in Princeton, New Jersey. He very gracefully uh, uh, accepted it, uh, my family as well. I've got photos of my daughters with him, but none with me. I was rather shy of <laughs> asking him for a photo. But the main question then was this uh, problem that he faced with astronomers. What don't we know about gravity? There's something really missing in our physics. Velikovsky argued that planets change orbits, exchange thunderbolts, and quickly settle into peaceful orbits. Rapid settling following chaos defies our understanding of gravitational systems, which for more than a two-body system are chaotic, as I said. If one planet departs from its normal orbit by a small amount, it will affect the others and there's no way of restoring the original situation. The system flies apart. Our understanding of gravity and solar system mechanics is inadequate. So, we have a new cosmology. A new forensic approach to old evidence produced a recent history of the solar system that requires a critical examination of modern science instead of dogmatic rejection of evidence. The result is an entirely new cosmology, the electric universe. The history of this new cosmological paradigm goes back to worlds in collision in 1950. In the last chapter, Velikovsky referred to Jupiter and Saturn as stars, and I quote, there I wrote with respect to the future that some dark star like Jupiter or Saturn may be in the path of the Sun and may be attracted to the system and cause havoc in it. That was in chapter 9, the end. Wells in Collision comprises only the last two acts of a cosmic drama, wrote Velikovsky in Kronos, volume 5, number 1, in 1979. That's the Kronos issue there. And then we have Dave Talbot's remarkable reconstruction of the earlier acts in our prehistoric skies, and that was published in 1980. 
Then in Eon Volume 5, Number 5, in January 2000, I first published my physical model of Earth's relationship to the dark star dubbed Proto-Saturn in Stars in an Electric Universe. It had appeared earlier on my website as Other Stars, Other Worlds, Other Life in December 1999. And then we have all the books uh, by Eduardo Cardona, and they're all there. God Star, published 2006, Metamorphic Star, 2008, Primordial Star, 2009, Flare Star, 2011. So the evidential history is Earth and Mars were satellites orbiting a brown dwarf star. It was a very hospitable environment for life. Atmosphere, water and minerals were deposited on the satellites. The system changed spectacularly on encountering the sun. The brown dwarf flared and ejected a new satellite. An axial column of satellites was formed and intense plasma discharge phenomena were observed. The terms giant and dwarf applied to stars are misleading. They're just calculated on the standard model of the sun. And the notion of a star's age based on its appearance or spectrum has no validity for the same reason. Stars on the main sequence may be characterized as self-regulating cosmic power transformers, as I spoke about this morning, that focus diffuse galactic electrical energy to catalyze fusion in their photospheres to provide radiant energy. Like the sun, such stars derive their luminosity from very bright anode tufts in their plasma sheaths. Moving diagonally upward to the right, the current density increases. Anode tufting becomes more crowded and their mutual repulsion forces the photosphere to grow to accommodate them. At the top right of the main sequence, the light from those tufts is electric blue of a true arc, and the stars appear as blue giants, intensely hot objects appearing considerably larger than our sun. As you might expect, blue giants tend to be concentrated on the central axes of our galaxy's spiral arm discharges. Red stars must collect more electrons than the plasma can deliver continuously to its surface. So bright anode tufts are unnecessary. The anode expands instead by forming a negative space charge sheath. And as that sheath expands, its electric field grows stronger. Electrons caught up in the field are accelerated to ever greater energies. And before long, they become energetic enough to excite neutral particles they collide with in the outer sheath to take on a uniform red glow. <clears throat> a white dwarf is a star whose discharge current is satisfied by all the approaching electrons. Drift electrons plus those that randomly move towards the anode. It has no anode tufting. It is rather like moving a low energy corona of a main sequence star down into the atmosphere of the white dwarf star. That's why the star, <clears throat> the, the dim star, Sirius B is brighter in X-rays than Sirius A because the corona emits X-rays. So, what is a brown dwarf? To summarise, a red or brown dwarf can be characterised as an independent gas giant type object under low electrical stress from its galactic environment. A main sequence star is electrically stressed, so it resorts to becoming a tufted anode, which, as I said, regulates the output of the star. This is why most all bright stars appear to uh, twinkle. Um, but they don't change uh, from day to day. Red giants are normal stars under low electrical stress. White dwarfs are stars with a low luminosity coronal discharge only. Uh, is that at the same point? Red giant, giants are normal stars under low electrical stress and white dwarfs. So, size matters. Brown dwarfs come with a major drawback for astronomers. Their stellar radii are hard to determine accurately. In the electric universe, brown dwarfs are not dwarf stars. Instead, all red stars have a bloated glowing anode sheath which expands and contracts in order to collect the amount of electrons required for that discharge. As the anode sheath grows, its electric field grows, which results in the prodigious and unexplained stellar winds from cool red giants. If the, if the winds were due to the heat of the corona, then uh, this, this puts paid to that idea. 
In a December 2008 NASA report, the brightness of a brown dwarf at 17 light years distance was twice that expected for a brown dwarf with its particular temperature. The solution? The object must have twice the surface area, they said. It must be twins. Such ad hocery is unnecessary in the electric universe model. A brown dwarf's photosphere is much larger than the standard model of such stars predicts. The cradle of life. <clears throat> and this gets back to the idea of uh, the Garden of Eden period in, um, in man's memory. If you are a satellite orbiting within that anode glow, and this is not an outrageous idea because astronomers have suggested the same thing for red giants, that planets could actually orbit within that uh, star because the atmosphere is such low density. In fact, we orbit in the sun's atmosphere, if you like, and it doesn't uh, cause us any trouble. But within that glowing shell, uh, the radiant energy received from that envelope is constant over the entire globe. The light from the plasma sphere is not reflected light, it's uh, radiant energy. Brown dwarfs radiate blue and ultraviolet light even though they are cool at a temperature around 950K. This is further evidence that we are looking at a mix of an electrical red anode glow and coronal ultraviolet blue end of the spectrum. There are no seasons, no tropics and no ice caps. A planet does not have to rotate, its axis can point in any direction and its orbit can be eccentric and you'll still get this beautiful even temperature over the whole body. The radiant energy received by the planet will be strongest at the blue and red ends of the spectrum, so photosynthesis, which relies on red light, would uh, be very active. The skylight would be a pale purple, which maybe is referred to by the classical purple dawn of creation. And I know that in Canberra we have this new arboretum, which is fantastic, and all of the new trees that are being planted are put in red plastic to start with. And I asked the, uh, the head of the arboretum why they did that, and he said the plants grow much better in red light. Water molecules dominate the spectra of brown dwarfs, so you want to know where the Earth's water came from? The light on Earth was dim and purplish amid a continuous mist of water. No other bodies in the system were visible. And this is what uh, Dave mentioned uh, yesterday. This explains the abundant water on Earth and many satellites of the gas giant planets and the rings of Saturn. And the red light, warmth and water was ideally suited for giant ferns. It explains the gigantic lush vegetation found at the poles, fossilised as coal. Now the problem faced by life on planets orbiting a red star, I think you saw last thing last night, which was this flaring red dwarf. So this tendency to flare up is a problem. The reason for this is that, as I said, the red stars don't have the current regulation afforded by uh, the bright photosphere. So the response of a red star to a sudden electrical disturbance in their environment is to shed charged matter in a flare-up. They may also change in apparent size as the anode glow accommodates to the electrical environment. I think this would account for the great dyings in the geological record and the episodic deposit of vast sediment and mineral layers on the Earth and on other bodies too. Every body that's been looked at is layered. What's more, it explains for the first time the oceans of salty water on Earth. Comets cannot be responsible because they have little or no water and little or no sodium chloride. The mass extinctions. As I said, those flare-ups can be so drastic that it would practically wipe out the life on any existing life on um, those uh, satellites of that uh, dwarf star. This raises an interesting <coughs> uh, side issue, and that is, ironically, intelligent life can't communicate through a, such a plasma shell using radio waves. So the lack of intelligible radio signals in the SETI project is understandable. In fact, denizens of such worlds would most likely be unaware of the universe at large. Now, astronomers also submit that orbiting a red dwarf is possibly one of the best places to look for life. 
what they've never considered is orbiting inside a red dwarf. So this is a picture of the brown dwarf proto-Saturn as I see it. Now there would have been many more bodies than you see there but I've included Mars and Earth and proto-Saturn because they're the main players at this stage. 50% of red dwarfs have Earth-sized planets in their conventional habitable zone. This suggests there are a large number hidden inside the red star's glow. And you can say that too because our gas giants all have large numbers of satellites orbiting quite closely. But you'll note there is no Venus at this stage. <coughs> Gigantism. It wasn't just pterodactyls that struggled to get up off the ground. The scaling of muscle and bone strength shows that dinosaurs could not have raised their bodies off the ground in today's gravity. For them to move about, Earth's gravity needed to be about one third of today's. Global extinction and fossilization requires far more than a simple impact. Clearly, we have no understanding of the cause of gravity. Is gravity electrical? The question is of fundamental importance for cosmology and our understanding of the solar system. And the answer should provide insights into the demise of the dinosaurs, the sky our ancestors saw, and why they feared doomsday. This is the crucial thing. This is the thing I asked Velikovsky. What don't we understand about gravity? <clears throat> and of course, we're getting confirmation of a sort from this uh, comet visit. The gas giant Saturn. It's the outermost planet visible to the naked eye, moving on an orbit almost 900 million miles from the sun. For those untrained in finding planets in the night sky, it could hardly be said that Saturn stands out amongst its starry companions. This lack of distinction underscores an unsolved mystery. Where did all of the extravagant images attached to this distant speck in the sky come from? The story of Saturn as creator. Saturn presiding over a lost golden age. Saturn as a primeval sun. Saturn's preposterous location at the celestial pole around which the heavens visually turn. Saturn as the founding father of kings. And Saturn as dying or displaced God. In due course, we'll take up the God's connection to an immense crescent seen as a scythe or sickle turning in the sky. So too the cosmic mountain from which Saturn was said to have once ruled the world. And the planet God's role as divine ancestor of different nations all recounting the same core idea. The mysteries will quickly overwhelm a researcher the moment he asks the present sky to explain the ancient themes. In fact, many scholars simply walked away from the dilemma. Here's the dilemma in a nutshell. The myths appear to be much older than any recorded observations of planets. The first flowering of the monumental civilizations occurred in an environment of myth and magic. There are no lists of planets, no diaries of planetary motions. The celebrated gods do not look at all like the planets we know so well today. So most scholars simply state that planetary behavior could not have provoked any of the great myths. The attachment of myths to planets must have come much later, perhaps in the first millennium BC. Our message, however, is that a radically different planetary arrangement prevailed in an earlier time. Planets, not in their present orbits, but planets provoked all of the mythic archetypes. What we're offering in this series are reasons for known facts, things not disputed. This includes the fact that the astronomer priests themselves in recording the tranquil and predictable motions of planets in later times named these bodies explicitly as the great gods of the primeval epoch. And that's the heart of the dilemma. 
Why does the behavior of these most venerated gods so boldly contradict all observations of the named planets today? By working with the points of cross-cultural agreement, we'll see that the astronomical images of Saturn connect theme by theme with an archaic story told around the world, told long after most cultures had lost track of any planetary connections. The story says that in a former time, a central luminary, a motionless sun turned as a great wheel in the sky. But why an identification with the planet Saturn? It's said that this ancient power, the father of kings, presided over an age of natural abundance and cosmic harmony. But this story and its countless variations does not end well. It states that the world fell into confusion when the ruling god fled the theater or tumbled from his appointed station. Then the hordes of chaos were set loose and all of creation slipped into a cosmic night. The gods themselves battling furiously in the heavens. The clash of the titans. In the well-known Greek tradition, this was the story of the displaced god Kronos, the father of kings. Kronos was the Greek name for the planet Saturn. And yet, enigmatically, the same planet was also named Helios, the sun, a fact that has perplexed classical scholars for a century and a half. The shadow cast by Saturn reached across the millennia. Even today, our language retains the age-old cultural ambivalence toward this most ancient god. The word Saturnian expresses the splendor of the Golden Age, while the word Saturnine reflects the melancholy of paradise lost. Guesses as to explanations will never work, but an explanation based on systematic cross-cultural investigation will work, allowing a global story to mean what it says, even if that requires a measure of patience as verifiable pieces come one by one into a coherent picture of the ancient sky. I wanted to make this video for the uh, little demonstration or I don't know what you really want to call it, storyboard, I guess, from John Cook. I think it's just absolutely brilliant and it needs attention. And uh, I'm just doing this for the sole purpose of pointing it out and making it a little easy for you to digest.
Not only that, but it was made four years ago, and I know he's no longer with us, which is a damn shame. The guy had, uh, he was rich with knowledge, and so I'm going to preserve it for sure. It's definitely worth it, just in case, you never know. I am not in the know whether or not anyone is taking care of his stuff. Just in case they're not, it needs to be preserved. But uh, definitely follow the link and go and visit. It's pretty crazy. He put a lot of work into it, I can tell. But this is a little synopsis of it. And I just made it for you. So in this video, I took the reading of the paper that he has included, Recovering the Lost World, while it shows. Enjoy. A historical synopsis of Saturnian cosmology from John Cook's website, saturniancosmology.org. There will be a link in the description. He gets pretty deep. The chapters of this site will propose that the biology of our planet, our culture, our psychology, and our very existence are the result of a series of incidents arising from the interaction between Earth and other planets within the solar system, most notably Saturn. The biology of Earth is such that a complete accident, and so utterly unlike it will not have ever been duplicated anywhere at any time among the billions of other star systems. But here on Earth, all of it, especially the rise of complex species since the Cambrian period 560 million years ago, can be attributed to a series of cataclysmic plasma strikes by Saturn, each of a very long duration. Biologists claim 10,000 years for the extinction events. My original estimate was 15,000 years. As hominids, we survived the last externally induced extinction event, which gave rise to eight competing subspecies over the course of the last three million years. Our only contribution to our distinction from other animals was the invention 10,000 years ago of language and its subsequent cultural transmission that set the stage for further development of our humanity. Much later on, and much closer to our time, subjective consciousness. It all started very long ago, at one time, and from its genesis, Earth was a planet in orbit around Saturn, a brown dwarf star, toward the end of the Precambrian. 600 million years ago, the Saturnian system intersected with the solar system. Saturn was swept around the sun and back into deep space to return at regular 26 to 27 million year intervals over the course of time. Some of the satellites, planets of Saturn, were wrenched from their orbits around Saturn to end up revolving around the sun instead. The Earth likely became a solar system planet at the end of the Permian 250 million years ago. From 600 million years ago, Saturn kept entering the solar system regularly to disturb its lost satellites, now circling the Sun. At about 3 million years ago, Saturn likely had a run-in with Jupiter, a solar system planet at that time, orbiting the Sun at a distance probably somewhat less than the Earth's orbit today. The orbital period of Saturn was significantly reduced as a result. During the last 3 million year period, Saturn started scavenging its lost satellites and perhaps solar system planets all in orbit close to the Sun. The possibility of a captured planet again orbiting Saturn at its equator is virtually nil. Instead, the scavenged planets ended up in superpolar or subpolar locations, the only locations which seem to be dynamically stable. Because Saturn had come in from outside of the solar system, and most likely was a star originally, it would have been at a very high positive charge level, distinct from the solar system planets. Solar system planets would have been attracted to Saturn when Saturn entered the solar system, rather than be repelled as would be the case of two planets with nearly equal values of charge. 
Saturn, with its stack of captured planets, was seen by hominids Homo erectus and recorded in the shapes of artifacts in the Paleolithic of about two million years ago, and by humans, Homo sapiens, as carved images in the Upper Paleolithic from 30,000 BC and by the hundreds of millions during the early Neolithic, 10,000 to 3,000 BC, when the stack of planets was much more frequently seen. At about 10,900 BC, Earth, at that time a planet of the Sun, made an electric field contact with Saturn, causing 1,500 years of darkness. Oh yeah, shadow on Earth. The period of darkness is recognized by many of the world's creation myths and was recorded in the illustrated graphic books of Mesoamerica, references to which are made in colonial period documents. Climatologically, the period is identified today as the Younger Dryas, when for some 1,500 years, Earth got as cold as it had ever been. Over the next 7,000 years, the orbit of Earth, apparently equal to the orbit of Saturn at that time, but below Saturn, progressively moved laterally to have Earth's orbital path eventually travel below the center of Saturn. Thus, between 10,900 BC and 3147 BC, Earth was part of a strange configuration of stacked planets, a condition which provided long summers and a mild climate in the northern hemisphere. Planets dominated by the giant form of Saturn stood above the north, the north horizon and close to Earth, but measured in millions of miles and were taken by humans to be gods who supported them and for whose benefit they labored at agriculture and conducted trade. Initially, during a 1,500-year period after 10,900 BC, when the cold of the Younger Dryas set in, and long before Saturn was clearly seen, three fiercely lighted ball plasmoids were seen far south of Earth. Below the South Pole, between about 10,900 BC and 8347 BC, these connected to Saturn and the North via strands of brilliant arcs of electrons. Forms of various shapes ran south over these electron lines, traveling toward the three plasmoids. The moving shapes were taken to be dead animals and dead humans. The objects in the sky became the basis for all original religions and a good deal of mythology throughout the world, for they persisted in showing nightly and seasonally over the course of 2500 years to 8347 BC, although only for three periods of hundreds of years. For the people of Mesoamerica, the year 8347 BC, when the last of the plasmoids extinguished after 2500 years, was the end of their first tally of years, which accounted for the first creation. We know only a little about these ball plasmoids from obscure mythological references, and we would still not know very much if it had not been for an investigation undertaken by a team led by Anthony Peratt of Los Alamos National Labs of some four million petroglyphs worldwide, carved high up on mountainsides facing in all directions, but always with a clear view toward the south. That study, published in the journal IEEE Transactions on Plasma Science in 2003, was an absolutely astounding revelation. More on that in a later chapter. In 4077 BC, Saturn dropped its coma. This had been the chaos before creation which had lasted some 7,000 years. It had obscured Saturn and its companion satellites. Saturn went nova. It switched to arc mode in a mass expulsion. Saturn produced its rings and a new satellite, Venus, and perhaps another. That's interesting. So they're saying that Venus came from Saturn and not Jupiter, like Golikovsky does. Okay. And Saturn lit up more brilliantly than the sun to the humans of Earth who had not clearly seen the real sun for thousands of years because of the shadow of the younger Dryas followed by the obscurity of the enclosing plasma sphere of Saturn. This was the start of creation, start of time, and the first showing of the land and its resident gods, the satellites of Saturn. Saturn 
was universally called the sun throughout the world. In Central America, the Papal Vu, written circa AD 1600 from much older records, recounts, like a man was the sun when it showed itself. It showed itself when it was born and remained fixed in the sky like a mirror. Certainly it was not the same sun which we see. It is said in their old tales. In arc mode, Saturn would have lost its glow mode coma, but it apparently retained a plasma stream connection to Earth. The sun, and the real sun, lighted part of the edge of Saturn in a crescent, which revolved around Saturn on a daily basis, visually caused by a daily rotation of Earth below Saturn. This stack of planets consisted from top to bottom of Uranus, on its side as today, and Neptune, both hidden by Saturn below them, known in Mesoamerica from earlier times. I suspect that these three planets had been seen together for perhaps two million years, initially by Homo erectus. Below Saturn, the following were located from top to bottom. Mercury joined the group in about 14,000 BC. Mars, resident probably since at least 30,000 BC or earlier, and Earth joined the group after 10,900 BC. In 3147 BC, this configuration of standing planets broke apart, with three large planets moving far away from the Sun and Earth and Venus released to overlapping inner orbits. The breakup produced a stupendous flood of the waters, which had been held at the south polar region due to the gravitational attraction of Saturn for some 7,000 years. The water held at the south pole was due to the lifting up of the Earth's crust in the Arctic and the sinking toward the Earth's interior in the Antarctic. Flood stories are ubiquitous, found in over 500 independent myths all with the same coherent details. The survivors included people far inland and those living already on mountain slopes, and apparently the people of the Nile Delta and northern Mesopotamia. The only recourse to a livelihood for many of the survivors was agriculture, which soon sprang up simultaneously in six unconnected regions of Earth. The breakup was caused by Jupiter, which had circled the Sun as an inner planet up to that time. Jupiter was subsequently seen receding in the skies, surrounded by a coma visually three times larger than the diameter of the moon today. Below the south pole of Jupiter extended a gigantic plasma outpouring, making it look like Jupiter was resting on a mountain. It was green initially. Above the planet were much smaller horn-like extensions. The whole of this looked like a person in a mantle but was also identified as the Bull of Heaven. Jupiter was taken as the new god, called the Younger. Jupiter retained its massive lower outpouring until it entered the asteroid belt in about 2860 BC, after which the coma reduced in size and changed its shape. After 3070 BC, Mars and Mercury, which had remained in their positions below Saturn, were released when Saturn entered the asteroid belt. The two planets crossed Earth's orbit for about 300 years, overriding the Earth's orbit close to Earth on a 30-year or 15-year average intervals. At those times, Mars was at times brought into plasma contact with Earth, looking like a squat mountain which circled the Earth. The visual effect of the rotation of Earth with Saturn and Jupiter both disappearing into the ecliptic. Mars was held to be the god in charge of Earth, Horus of the Egyptians. This lasted till about 2750 BC or 2700 BC, after which the regular visits of Mars ended its elliptical orbit, perhaps rotating away from Earth, an apocidal procession. In the next century, people throughout the world start building pyramids in imitation of the disappeared mountain of Mars, all within a hundred years of each other. In Egypt, Mesopotamia, England, China, and the Andes of South America, and many other locations such as Greece and the Balkans, as has been discovered in recent years, although not validated. We have recorded histories of these celestial events, especially in Mesoamerica, 
There are accurate descriptions of the rings and the number of satellites of Saturn, the cloud bands and satellites of Jupiter, and the scarred surface and satellites of Mars, all dating from antiquity spanning cultures worldwide. The Egyptians produced schematic images of the original configuration of Saturn and the satellite planets below and have a record of early close passes by Mars. Mesopotamians also produced images of planets, graphically showing, for example, all the satellites of Jupiter. The Maya, from Olmec sources, have an undated record of the planetary movements from long before 3147 BC and a dated record of later events which matches what can be gleaned from Eastern Mediterranean sources. The Aztecs produced graphic images of these planets, although anthropomorphized, to gods and produced very late. South Sea Islanders have similar records of rings of Saturn. India has similar recollection of these events extending over millions of lines of poetry. The Quiche, Maya, Papa Vu, and pages of the Maya books of the Chilambalam makes casual reference to the period of 13,000 years ago, probably 10,900 BC. One page of the Chilambalam records seven appearances of the Saturnian planets as far back as perhaps 40,000 years, which can be collated with atmospheric carbon-14 records dating from 50,000 BP. Over the next 2,500 years, 3147 BC to 685 BC, the inner planets interfered with Earth at intervals, although very infrequently. There were four major additional incidents. The damage often was localized in latitude, although, for example, a continuous lightning strike might have encircled the globe in circa 1492 BC, and certainly repeatedly in the 8th and 7th century BC. As recalled by nearly all peoples on all continents, the most terrifying incident, however, happened in 2349 BC, when in alignment with Venus, 20 million miles away at the time, 32,200,000 kilometers, produced an Earth shock in the northern hemisphere, tilting the Earth's axis away from the sun temporarily and tilting up the equatorial rings of the Earth. Earth at one time had equatorial rings. This was followed perhaps six hours later by the arrival of a massive disconnected plasmoid lightning bolt from Venus, which hit the rings almost broadside, followed somewhat later by lesser bolts recorded in Mesoamerica and China. The electric contact with Venus turned the equatorial rings blood red and caused the destruction of the rings. Lightning bolts are up to the rings from the Earth's ionosphere layers and the lower equatorial plasma toroid, the Van Allen belt. The sky bled for three days and only a single ring remained. Dust continued to rain down for the next 4,000 years until AD 1600. The cleared southern skies previously obscured by the Earth's rings revealed a multitude of stars for the first time, most notably the Pleiades, located directly south at midnight, two nights after the equinox. The equatorial plasma toroid would have also arced to the surface of Earth, producing months of torrential rains. To humanity, the sea of the Earth's equatorial rings in the south sky, the Absu, had collapsed to Earth, and the event was almost everywhere understood as a second flood of stupendous proportion. The Bible recalls this event as the flood of Noah, but to most peoples, the blood seen in the sky suggested the wholesale slaughter of humanity, and any number of raging goddesses or dragons were assigned to this event in mythology worldwide. Kali, Tiamat, Manath, Sekhmet, Hathor, and much later, Beowulf's Grindel. After two and a half days, Jupiter appeared again with its previous giant coma and lower mantle, again understood as a mountain, as if risen from the dead. In fact, the rise of the equatorial in the sky made it look as if Jupiter rose up out of the cave previously seen as the shadow of the Earth on the rings. The cave-shaped shadow opened up as the Earth regained its normal inclination, and Jupiter rose out of this to a location above it. Jupiter had stopped the dragon from killing additional humans. 
The event itself remains commemorated as the Day of the Dead, which is why they wear Halloween masks on Halloween. It's so that the spirits don't recognize them, the ones that might want revenge. I believe that's what that's about. And is almost universally associated with the culmination of the Pleiades in autumn. Echoes of the fall of the rings and the surrounding circumstances continued to re resound in mythology and to this day in the theologies and practices of many religions, especially the resurrection of Jupiter on the third day. Many nations also date the start of all sensible history and their calendars from this event. Strangely, this event is simply not noted by any of the catastrophists. Even Velikovsky remained unaware of it. Hmm, interesting. 800 years later, in 1492 BC, Venus again made an electric contact with Earth, causing a crushing repulsive blow in the East Central Pacific. The Pacific Islands were wiped clean of any trace of humans, except for the petroglyphs carved on every island thousands of years earlier. Coastal South America and Central America were inundated with water, leaving seawater traces in lakes high up in the Andes and possibly causing a sudden rise in the coastal range of the Andes by thousands of feet. The blow was followed by an electric arc traveling through the Pacific, the Indian Ocean, and part of India, following a path of increasingly higher latitude into the Mediterranean as the Earth's axis angled back toward the sun. Moses made his escape from Egypt during the turmoil. The event is recalled in mythology as the attack of the monster Typhon, who is struck down by Zeus. The major result of the contact was a 30% increase in the orbit of the Earth. The year went from 273 days to 360 days. Venus probably came no closer than 10 million miles. In this instance, 16 million kilometers. Something else was initiated at this time. The movement of tribes away from devastated areas and failing climates into new regions happened after 1492 BC. Tribes of Central Asia entered India, Anatolia in Greece. Tribes from Asia Minor settled in Italy, as well as at later dates also. People everywhere met strangers and had to cope with new living conditions. This resulted in an expansion of our imagination as a way of coping with these changes. The development of subjective consciousness before this time, there was little need to deal with change. The people of Egypt and Mesopotamia, for whom we have records, have remained stagnant in the way of life of their forebears for thousands upon thousands of years. The development of subjective consciousness, as opposed to mere consciousness, was a cultural innovation and the major change which made us humans. Subjective consciousness came to be taught to children by parents exactly like language is taught. The teaching of subjective consciousness, like the teaching of language, can be readily observed today. Note 5. Another 700 years later, 806 BC to 687 BC, Mars closed in on Earth with repeated electric arc contact at 15-year intervals. A major Earth shock in 747 BC and a minor shock in 686 BC, this last caused by Mercury. Earlier, Mars also interfered with Earth in a similar fashion at the close of the early Bronze Age, 1935 to circa 1700 BC, which includes the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Mars came close, perhaps within 40,000 miles of Earth. The interactions, as a result, were completely different from the long-distance shock due to Venus. The destructions of the 8th and 7th century BC were spread over long stretches from Central Asia to the Western Mediterranean and through to Mexico and Southern United States. From the Persian Plateau to Greece in swaths measuring more than 600 miles wide. Hilltop citadels were destroyed by quick-like convulsions, much more extensive than any earthquake, and by massive lightning strikes. Cities and citadels were buried under yards of carbonized material mixed with soil. The soil and burned forest were dropped whenever the traveling lightning bolt paused at a hilltop. Oh, that's pretty crazy. I mean, this lightning bolt traveling around, just going anywhere. These simultaneous destructions 
have been noted in the archaeological record and include the events of the 8th and 7th century as well as 1935 BC. De Grazia estimates that only 2.5% of the original population of 200 million of the Mediterranean region survived. Bolsena, a city in Italy, was obliterated by a lightning bolt measuring more than five miles, eight kilometers in, in diameter. If we are to believe Pliny, who presents this from older Etruscan sources, the circular lake at Bolsena, the circular lake at Bolsena is larger than any volcanic caldera. Mars became the next sky god to set a tone for human conduct lasting this day. The destructions of the 8th and 7th century BC obliterated the coastal areas of Greece and coastal Anatolia. The remnant population turned to raiding and became the pirates celebrated in the Iliad as the Egyptian people of the sea. The Iliad reveals that these were no sailors. Warfare and the extraction of tribute also became a way of life for the Assyrians who plundered from Elam to Egypt. The change in humanity, however, which suddenly brought up, brought people up to our current expectations was an event which happened early in the 7th century BC. In 685 BC, Venus and Mercury blazed as bright as the sun and were seen in the daytime skies with the sun for 40 days, starting on June 15th. The event was probably an extraordinary plasma outpouring by the sun, brought on by a sudden relocation of Mercury to within the orbit of Venus in the previous year. In July 685 BC, actually the astronomical year minus 685, corrected from 680 BC, Julian in the Eastern Mediterranean chronology. Ah, okay, so that's what the minus is for. It's different. It's astronomical. Okay. Jupiter also erupted with a coma in response in Jupiter also erupted in a coma in response to the sun's increased output of plasma. And on July 14th, sent a return lightning stroke, a plasmoid bolt headed for the sun. It arrived at the Sun on July 25th. The plasmoid, which, which passed by the Earth at a distance of 30 million miles, 48 million kilometers, was seen in foreshortened form by Asia and Europe. How about that Jupiter taking a swing at the Sun? <laughs> and is depicted in sculptures and illustrations and even on coins. Mediterranean nations thought that Venus or Mercury was struck the bolt from Zeus, which toppled Phaethon from the sun's chariot. Mesoamerica saw the plasmoid at full length as it passed by in the daytime. That would be wild to see something like that, and depicted it correspondingly differently. Their understanding was that Mars was struck. It was called the bundle of flame. Among the Maya, to China, this was the celestial dragon, the traditional form of which matches the structure of a plasmoid lightning bolt. Note six. One could spend a lot of hours on this website here with this. This is amazing. Um, got a little bit more to go here. As experienced by Earth, the after effect of the 40 days of extreme solar activity was the relocation of the polar axis from Ursa Major to near Ursa Minor, and the delay of spring by some 15 days. In effect, changing the inclination of the polar axis, which is equivalent to rotating the dome of the stars, a new equinox was suddenly established, the aphelion of the Earth's orbit. The location furthest from the sun changed, and 120 years of interference by Mars and Mercury came to a sudden halt. It appeared to many that Jupiter, the historical supreme god of antiquity, had again saved mankind from destruction. The change in Aphelion had resulted in a cessation 
of further interactions with Mars. In 670 BC, the Earth's orbit became nearly circular for unknown reasons. And the Earth was in fact completely removed from any future interference by any of the inner planets. It's probably the Sun's uh, magnetic sphere, I'd imagine. Within 100 years of this event, we see the simultaneous rise of philosophical studies much as we understand them today in China, India, Mesopotamia, Anatolia, North Africa, and Rome. Well before there was any cultural transmission before the more distant regions on the list, in this list. It appeared to many as if a far greater power beyond the dome of the stars had moved the stars and planets and restarted the universe. For many years of the philosophers, the causes for natural phenomena were now sought elsewhere than in the whims of old planetary gods. With the realization of the existence of a power beyond the planets and stars, we also see the sudden rise of all the modern religions within the span of 100 years. Taoism and Confucianism in China, Jainism and Buddhism in India, with its subsequent influence on Hinduism, Zoroastrianism in Persia, with its influence on Judaism, Mithraism, Christianity, and eventually on Islam. Similar changes seem to be attested to in Mesoamerica, probably dating from 600 BC. Could all this really have happened? Religions have attempted to explain all of it. Initially as narrations of the observed events, eventually as metaphors of spiritual states. Science, on the other hand, has spent the last 200 years denying that anything at all ever happened. But look at the histories, what we call myths, of people from regions as diverse as China, Mesopotamia, and Mesoamerica, will reveal that they are in complete agreement with each other. Add to these various myths of the people of India, South America, Africa, Greece, and thousands of others, and a consistent picture of the past emerges, which is not what science tells us. Or flyover regions, for example, of the western United States, and you will soon be convinced that the waves of hills, the conical dumps of wind-borne soil, the distorted folded mountains, the widely varied landscape, cannot possibly be the result of eons of slow movement and metamorphosis of the Earth's crust. The surface of the Earth appears to have been battered and racked convulsively, and widely varied landscape and recently. Except for geology, which I will not really touch on, the remaining chapters will fill in the details and broaden the scope for major events. The four events are the end of the Age of the Gods and the worldwide flood of 3147 BC, the fall of the Absu, known as the Flood of Noah, the Blood in the Sky, the resurrection of Jupiter and the first appearance of the Pallades, 2349 BC, the defeat of Typhon and the exodus of Moses from Egypt in 1492 BC, and the blazing of Venus and Mercury and the thunderbolt of Jupiter, which toppled Phaethon in 685 BC. The last few chapters present an excursion into the site plans and iconography of Mesoamerica from about 2000 BC. In these last chapters, you will find that the more closely detailed findings from Mesoamerica will match and often exceed the information available from the Eastern Mediterranean. tell you this is pretty in-depth and in detail there's just tons more I figured it'd be okay to read this because it's free to the public here on his website SaturnianCosmology.org he's got a lot of stuff on here it goes into Osiris and new findings 
uh, things like the Earth never turned over, at least not completely and certainly not permanent, a nearly impossible notion. I dispute this and discuss the origin of these ideas in the appendix, Polar Relocations dis Disputed. There's just a whole bunch of them, and he's got a little store here, too, where you can buy some cool-looking t-shirts. I might end up getting one. And uh, some websites. It's called EndNotes. It's got pretty much every website one could think of dealing with Saturn theory. I'm going to be using it for a couple of websites. Uh, we're going to do maverickscience.com with E.V. Cochran, and I want to do uh, Saturn Death Cult with Troy McLaughlin. I was calling him McLaughlin, but it's McLaughlin. Apologies there. Uh, electricuniverse.info, barefabrique.org, well that's our buddy Ted Holden. We'll be taking a look at his site. Catastrophism.com, Science Frontiers, ElectricCosmos.org, ChronosPress.com, Thunderbolts, of course. A lot of good sites here, and it's got some pretty nifty-looking T-shirts too. So stop on in and check this site out. It's really good. He's got a couple of books for sale. So I hope I gave him some positive PR. If you're into Saturn theory, this is definitely the place to stop. He takes more of a orthodox approach with the chronology, but hey, the chronology of it is uh, one of the main reasons why I'm surfing these sites to try to put it together and bring it to you. Thanks for watching. I'd like to say thank you to all of you who have donated to support my work. I can't thank you enough. Okay, that'll do it for me this time around. Take care. I'll see you on down the road. Yeah, we are really going to call it for this one, but I'm coming back for part two. As long as I still have Andy. Are you there? I gotta unmute my mic. Andy? Andy, are you there? Hey, Greg. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I'm here, Greg. Just I'm on. And when you're not on this, so we can get back. Back play? Yeah. Okay, go. <laughs> yeah, we've been, uh, let's see. We've been going for quite Up a while. Open our fails, though. Hey, we got 58 viewers. How about that, huh? Huh? How long have we yeah, been going? Yeah, it's doing okay. How long? Five have... and a half hours nearly. Really? Five and a half? Yeah, I just said. Five hours, five hours, roughly five, five hours, 30 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, that's cool. Uh, we okay. can squeeze one so more. Do you want to do a number two or you got taller? Um, All right, then. Squeeze oh, yeah. one more in. Try well, to get it under. It's got to be under six minutes, though. Or how many minutes? Five, yeah. five and under six Thirty hours, minutes. Isn't it? Thirty minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. This has been pretty good. So let's end this. Oh, right, then. Yeah, and I'll just just stay right there. Yep. We'll come right back. Just I'll put it right in the live stream. Okay.